Number 10, not bathing. Let's start off strong. So obviously hindsight is 2020. We know a lot of more about personal hygiene now than we did, you know, then and as well in like middle school because high school locker rooms, what the heck. Without the knowledge of germs and disease, not bathing seemed like the logical next step for a lot of people, even though it made you smelly as all heck. When the pilgrims arrived in Native America on the Mayflower, the indigenous tribes often referred to their horrid smell. An account from a member of the Patuax Nation even tried to convince them to start washing themselves. They were like, come on guys, it's enough. They washed their hands and faces, but they rarely washed their whole bodies. Though they believed cleanliness was next to godliness, that didn't necessarily mean they needed water to do it. They believed that should they submerge themselves, they risk disease. This could be because they dumped their daily duties into the water, so you know, that's, that's likely. So instead they took dry baths where they wiped themselves down with a dry cloth. But this, that it, it didn't really help much. Number nine, bedpans. It's always the worst when you get tucked in at night, you start to fall asleep, you're starting to doze off, and then you realize you need to pee. It's the worst, you gotta get up, walk down that long scary hallway, blind yourself for two minutes, and then get cozy all over again. Well, in the Middle Ages, you would just toss your full bedpan out the window. Easy peasy, heads up, oh, oops, <laughs> it's so gross. Or sometimes if you're feeling a little lazy, this was also common, you would use the bedpan and then just slide it back underneath your bed and go right back to sleep. If anybody ever gives you shit for having cups in your room, show them this video, show them this history. You're fine, you're not that bad. Back in those days, we weren't exactly aware of the disease that we threw out the window as well. Most of the time it was number one, so the rain could just, you know, wash away the yuck. But these buildings were only one story. There wasn't, it wasn't going anywhere. If you were tossing anything out, you'd be stepping over it the next morning on the way to, you know, the public execution or whatever. Number eight, a lead facial. Today, if you have tan skin from that hot summer glow, it implies that you have had enough leisure time to acquire such a hue. Getting a tan is the thing, unless you're like me and slather on that sunscreen for health and so you look like a newborn baby when you're 80 years old. However, it was the opposite in times of old. If you had sun-kissed skin, that meant you worked hard in the fields, a symbol that you were a peasant or of lower class. If you were rich, you tended to have much paler skin, therefore implying your status. But simply staying out of the sun wasn't enough. Elizabeth I used a combination of lead and vinegar to achieve a bright white complexion and to hide her smallpox scars. The compound was called ceruse. This tradition even goes all the way back to women in the Roman Empire. Empire. A well-known actress named Kitty Fisher was also said to have died from the material as it slowly poisoned her with daily use. The material would add blisters so she put more on to cover it up. Same with Elizabeth and yes, slowly you understand. Number seven, Victorian laundry day. You spill some mustard on your shirt today, that stain will be gone by the time you get home. We're pretty advanced when it comes to quick stain removal today, but like the Romans, which I'll talk about later, it wasn't always smooth sailing. Take the 18th century, for example, when laundry day came around, it was an event. It was like an ultimate chore. They had to take daylight in consideration and plan their washing days, as in more than one. The Victorian era was exhausting. They would soak their clothes overnight, then the next day would be spent soaping the them up, boiling them, rinsing, soaping again, rinsing again, maybe soap one more in case you know there's too much pee pee, and then rinsed another time, wrung out, mangled, laid out to dry, hence the sunlight timing, starched and then slowly ironed. Cut to today, we have to encourage adults not to eat Tide Pods or drink bleach. We'll get there, maybe, I don't know. Number six, wigs and makeup. When you don't bathe, and are overall just smelly, you're gonna need to do something to cover up whatever the heck is building up beneath that bodice. Wigs would have never become as popular if it weren't for a very specific venereal disease called syphilis. By 1580, the STD was the worst epidemic since the Black Death. Patients clogged hospitals and without antibiotics or protection, things got pretty nasty. Sores, blindness, rashes, dementia, and patchy hair loss. Thus, for the sake of keeping up appearances, wigs came into fashion. Also the makeup I mentioned before. Balding was a huge humiliation, so they made wigs out of horse, goat, and or human hair. They also cover the wigs in powdered, scented with lavender or orange to hide any foul odors, and as we suspect, there were a lot of foul odors. They weren't stylish until 1655 when the King of France started losing his hair and had 48 wigs made. Then five years later, his cousin Charles II of England joined the train and suddenly powdered wigs became like the next best thing. Wigs did help curb the lice problem though because the human hair had to be shaved in order for the perukes to be worn. But the wigs themselves had to be deloused often. 
and yeah. Number five, urine deep. Turns out we used pee for a lot of things back in the day and today we still do? Question mark? The Romans used urine to wash their clothes and even more impressive slash gross is the fact that they used urine to help with inflammation, burns, or skin disease. Yeah, pee was the number one trick. Get it, number one? I, okay, we'll move on. Best way to whiten that smile was not a crest white strip, but rather a facial mask dip, dipped, dipped in the mellow yellow. Just pee, because it's so gross. We mentioned on this channel before that gladiator sweat was once bottled and then sold. Well, their pee as well was sold as this beauty product. Clean out those pores with a drop of Igor. Mm. Get it while it's hot, folks. This is extremely gross, obviously, but it does make sense. The ammonia in urine kicks stains away for good. That's why they would wash their clothes in the same way. Now we get it. History. Gross. Uh, number four, rush plants. Today we use chic shag carpets that, you know, really tie the room together. Sips white Russian. But back in the olden times, they used something called the rush plant to pad their floors. But the thing was, this layer of dense plant material was a breeding ground for nits, ticks, and other creepy crawlies. It was it was a really unsanitary situation, but well, like what else were you supposed to do? However, this kind of flooring made them vulnerable to disease and infection. The reason being, as these floors would not be renewed for sometimes 20 years, the bottom layer, left undisturbed, would accumulate a lot of really gross stuff like uh, animal droppings, feces, the piece of grizzle you dropped that one time, fish craps, whatever. So um, it was just not, it was like a, basically a swamp down there. Number three, royal bum. The groom of the stool is a little bit different than the groom of a wedding. It was perhaps one of the worst jobs to have, but, but, pun intended, it's one of the most important roles. The groom of the king's close stool was a position created during King Henry VIII's reign. Their job was to wipe the king's butt. And if that doesn't sound horrible enough, this poor lad would carry the king's stool with him, like on his back, like a Jansport, and then monitor the king's mealtimes, and they would plan their day around when they thought the king would take a sh I would be so anxious if a guy wearing a box toilet was just hanging out near me. He's like, hey, you feeling all right, boss? You good? You feeling full? That was a lot of bread earlier. You sure? All right, take five. Just, I don't know. Just take a look. I don't know. I'll let you be. Just jump. You must be thinking, what poor soul got stuck with this job? Well, this job was an honor, my friend. Sons of noblemen were awarded this role. You would get pretty close to the king. I mean, obviously, but as time went on, these grooms became secretaries to that king. Pretty good upgrade. Eventually, getting a higher pay and benefits. Yeah, I would hope so. Even the king's walking, talking toilet gets dental back in the day. How neat is that? Number two, eagle dung. I'm honestly not even sure what to say about this. You know, you have to have some kind of magnificent conviction to be like, I have no reason to believe this is true, but I am 110% sure that bird dung will fix it. Like that's some kind of confidence I don't think I'm ever gonna get. Eagle dung was a common substance found in the birthing room of all places. It was often rubbed in to alleviate the pain, most often accompanied by rose water because who wants to smell that while well, they're bringing life to the world? No one, obviously. Obviously that didn't work and the bacteria from the stuff probably didn't help their recovery either. They also used to place amulets and charms on the stomach to speed contractions and put coriander on the thighs. Coriander was believed to attract the baby out of the womb. A risky move considering people either love or hate coriander. There's no in between. It either tastes like soap or it's the best thing you've ever had. If the delivery was proving difficult, they would open covered doors, untie hair and perform other metaphors to help the mother deliver easier. But it's the eagle dung that really gets me here, folks. I, I, have, no, I have no excuse for them. Number one, the dirty dead. What feels like a never ending maze, the catacombs under Paris stretch for hundreds of miles. They're a big tourist attraction, obviously today, horror movies have been made about these catacombs, just these walls of skulls. But where did they come from? Why were they put there? Also, how bad was that smell? See, originally the tunnels were built for Paris stone mines, but near the end of the 18th century, its purpose started to shift. Cemeteries were starting to pile up, and I mean that in a literal sense, disgusting. There was nowhere to put all these bodies, and everybody else started to get sick because of them, because they were breathing in, you know, dad corpse hot dog breath. They didn't quite know how to handle the dead in a clean way, so they just wanted these bodies out of sight and out of mind. So all these dead bodies that were laying in alleys or on the side of the road, they were gathered and then tossed under the city in these tunnels. These tunnels have been there for centuries before them, so you might as well put them to good use. And by good use, I mean let's just stack skulls in an orderly fashion and terrorize civilians for centuries to come. Beautiful. Number 10, spinning. 
Two words, chewing tobacco. I am not the only one I know it who made this face while watching western movies and some grimy guy just like spits into a bucket like poo, some like brownie green slime. In saloons in the old wild west, spitting became so common that it had to be outlawed at one point. Men would spit tobacco onto the floor with spittoons and cups of doors lined the bar. Most of the time, they missed. The job of cleaning them often fell to junior shop assistants, which was a worse job than cleaning a fast food chain bathroom. They essentially became little cesspools of disease, and people got really worried eventually because, no duh, they're spitting all their stuff everywhere. Following the devastating flu epidemic of 1918, plus the constant fear of TB, anti spitting campaigns were undertaken and it was outlawed. Number nine, shine bright like a diamond. If somebody told you that your face was glowing back in the late 30s, that would be the highest of all compliments. You'd be like, oh my god, thank you. I am not a vampire, but thank you. Thoradia was a beauty product company that made radioactive creams, radioactive powders, radioactive lipsticks, anything to get your glam on, all for the price of radioactive products. It didn't end well. This is insane to me. They took pride in using thorium and radium lead to tone facial tissues and remove wrinkles and all that jazz. And the product was doing so well that it circulated in Italy, Portugal, Romania, Egypt, Belgium, and France. Worldwide. It wasn't until 1937 until the French government caught on to these little pesky side effects, some would call. So the radium would literally make your skin glow a bit. That was the pull. That was like the, no way, really? Debit. And alongside the glow, also, you were having insane side effects that would ruin the rest of your life. Maybe that's Paul Rudd's secret. If his jaw starts to fall off, we'll know something's up, perhaps. Number eight, the humors. Nope, this is not a joke. Ha <laughs> ha though it sounds like it. Ever heard the phrase to be in good humor? Well, it goes back to this. I mean, probably. I actually don't know, but it sounds like the two are connected. The four humors were the basis of medical treatment in medieval times. The idea was introduced by Hippocrates all the way back in ancient Greece, which combined ancient science, naturalistic knowledge, and philosophy. The four humors were blood, yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. They were organized to represent the four elements, the four qualities of cold, hot, moist and dry, as well as the four seasons and planets. If something was wrong with you, then it was because one of the humors was out of whack. If you were depressed, something was wrong with your black bile, for instance. Do I know what black bile is? No, I don't want to ever know. Are you too hot? Well, bloodletting will be the solution for that. The factors controlling your humoral makeup involved sex, age, temperament, and many more. Bloodletting was the most popular way of balancing the humors, and it was assumed to have a relationship with most diseases, from smallpox to pseudoscientific hysteria. What, you horny? Let's bloodlet ya. Number seven, public bathhouse. Okay, this next one, we haven't really moved on that much. We still bathe together, we still do it in like water parks, we swim in pools of pee pee, and then go down slides and burn our back skin off. Ancient Roman, it's so great, you're like, why did you have to ruin it? Ancient Roman bathhouses were the older, yuckier versions of these water parks. They also didn't have slides, so. Boo. They would literally spread intestinal parasites in these houses, pools, in these massive rooms with massive pools. The Romans were figuring out sewage systems at the same time, which I'll talk more about later, gladly, but they were also the first to create heated public baths. My above ground pool wasn't even heated, but the ancient Romans were. Now I'm upset. I'm gonna call my dad after this. The archaeology and anthropology department at Cambridge discovered that Romans brought lots of parasites to Europe. Fossilized feces show that these heated, relaxing, rejuvenating bathhouses nearby were all but. I don't mean to undermine the ancient Romans though, it's not what I'm doing, okay? To be fair, they also brought lice and fleas. Number six, no hand washing. I don't know. Believe it or not, washing your hands as a doctor before doing anything was a controversial idea. Today, especially due to the last two years, we all have a tune we sing while washing our hands to ensure we're laughing for like full 20 seconds. We've all done it. But when doctors discovered it was their fault people were getting sick, they didn't rejoice, they got offended. The whole conversation started because of a man called Ignaz Semmelweis. He was studying the differences between two birthing hospitals, one run by midwives, the other by doctors and students. The mortality rate at the latter was way higher than the other. They were dying from something known as childbed fever, more closely known as sepsis. After a series of trial and error, he hypothesized that it was because the students were touching cadavers and then touching the mothers. He then made them clean every tool in their hands with chlorine solution, literally the best thing to kill germs, though he didn't know that at the time, he just assumed it would work. Well, wouldn't you know mortality rates improved significantly, but when he tried to enforce his findings, doctors were upset they were being blamed for the deaths. He ended up getting fired over it and eventually thrown into a mental asylum near the end of his life. <sighs> Considering what we know now, that's rough. 
Number five, dark dental days. Dental health is important. We have the charcoal toothpaste trend that I myself even hopped onto recently, but why are we even doing it? Do we know other than it's on TikTok? Well, it helps remove stains, but aside from that, there's no hard evidence that this is the next best brushing method. We do it because it's popular. It feels like we're missing out on something. Well, Queen Elizabeth the first apparently had a pretty strong desire for a Mars bar too, but back in the day, they didn't have TikTok. Brushing wasn't cool, nor was it perfected in any sense. The queen's teeth became riddled with cavities. Her teeth straight up began to rot and subsequently turn black. But seeing as she's the literal queen, people wanted to be just like her in any way. She started a short-lived trend where women blacken their teeth on purpose just so they would appear rich enough to afford sugar. That's wild. That's like me walking around in a neck brace being like, oh yeah, I crashed my Lamborghini. I totally have one of those. Number four, arsenic. I think they were confusing this chemical with Accutane, which is a chemical we use today to treat acne. But for a while, arsenic wafers were used. Yes. The poison, arsenic, the thing that would kill you. Yeah, that one. In the 19th century, arsenic was marketed as a safe way, safe way, to effectively clear your skin. It also claimed to restore a youthful complexion that we as humans always long for. Now, it did create a very pallid complexion, but not because it was restoring the gift of life, but because it was killing off the consumer's blood cells. Yay! It also cleared acne pretty well, but it also created a dependency on the product. If the user discontinued using the wafers, then the acne would return even worse this time. Therefore, it would create a vicious cycle of slowly poisoning oneself to death because you'd have to go back on it so you'd look hot. I don't know. Number three, the trico system. Instead of plucking your eyebrows before prom or getting waxed head to toe like we commonly do so today, back in the 1920s, you needed the trico system to remove any unwanted hair. This device was booming in the 20s. Hair salons just had to have this machine. I'll call it machine. It was changing the game. By 1925, there were over 75 systems installed in beauty shops. And what you would do is you would sit at this large desk, face a tiny small window, and for a few minutes, you would just be beautiful. Just 20 simple treatments of this radiation beaming off your face and then bam, you're beautiful. What's, what's the trick you ask? Radiation, they didn't know this yet, it was dangerous. They didn't know much at the time, but this thing was chock full of radiation. They used x-ray technology on their bare faces. That's like when you go to the dentist and they click the thing and then they run into another room. This one, they're like, just right there. No sheet, no metal, heavy thing, just face to face, now I'm hot. So in 1929, trico problems were on the rise. Ulcers, carcinoma, keratosis, death, just everything bad. This was not the solution you wanted, but you know what, at least you were hot. Sorry, gents, this isn't for you. Number two, moss. Okay, I'm not the only one who has asked this question in their minds. Periods. How in the heck did we deal with them without pads, tampons, diva cups, and my doll? I don't know. How? Well, <laughs> it doesn't look good, folks. It took a lot of trial and error to get us where we are now. The first disposable pads only came onto the market in 1888. Like, ugh, what? Even earlier prototypes of menstrual cups were made out of aluminum or hard rubber. But you may be surprised to learn that moss was a common resource. Yeah, the thing you see on rocks and trees. Cloth and cotton weren't enough, so they resorted to using moss to help absorb ant flow when she came by. It could have been grabbed from anywhere. Although we know that moss isn't the most hygienic of materials, as it could be grabbed from anywhere, as I just previously stated, a rock, a tree, who knows? Physicians believed it had antiseptic properties. They even used it on the battlefield to stem the flow of blood. Menstruation at the time was considered a sign of witchcraft, even though it happened every month. Poisonous and dangerous at the time. <laughs> okay, I know desperate times call for desperate measures, but like, they reused it. They didn't throw it out after. Ugh. Ugh. And finally, number one. Roman toilets. When I go to the washroom, number two, whatever, that's my time. I'll straight up hold it for like three business days until I get home. It's called a bowel movement for a reason. It's a movement, it's an event. I need isolation, quietness. These poor Romans, I mean, thank you for inventing the toilet and all, that's really, great and dandy, but I feel very bad for the first group of individuals that had to use these stone benches. The early OG toilets. God, that looks so cold. Also, I guess stalls, like walls, they weren't invented until much later. Couldn't have thrown up some Bristol board, Euphelius? I don't want to be shoulder to shoulder with a guy who accidentally gulped uh, some public spa water hours prior. And don't even worry about wiping also, because that wasn't invented until much later. You just do the old scrape, do the old stone cold scrape off the bench and then call it a day. Give this video a Roman thumbs down if you're glad for toilets. That means thumbs up. 
Kicking off the list at number 10, medieval manicures. You can clip your toenails anywhere you want these days. An alarming amount of people do it on airplanes, apparently. Yuck. But how do we clip those little piggies back in the day? Before modern fingernail clippers were patented in 1875, we have to look to the ancient Romans and how they got rid of those hangnails. Biting them off, of course, that was the best way. That bad habit I'm sure half of you have, as well as me. That was the best way. Boink. Eating the, eating the nails, bad, bad stuff. In 35 BC, biting nails was written as a way of dealing with nervousness. Even back then, anxiety still had, it was a thing, of course. Ancient Greeks had a tool that looked a lot like toenail clippers, but it was actually used for pulling hairs. I'll get into that one a little bit later. It's a bit more intense. Medieval methods for cutting your nails were usually to use a small knife, so around the Babylonian age, the newly invented scissors would just do the trick as well. You just gotta have really good aim. They're big, rusty, giant, comedically big scissors almost. Sandpaper was also commonly used as well, and to that, I say, great idea. We still use that today. Number nine, hot pokers. Okay, I absolutely hate this so much. It makes me cringe, and it will probably do the same to you. No wonder people are actually afraid of going to the doctors. Their ancestors had good reason to be. It was pretty much comparable to going to a torture clinic. Yeah. Though I have to say there was some sense behind this one. If you were to receive an injury where the loss of blood could be fatal, cauterizing the wound was a good way to stop it. But it would definitely suck. They would heat up a hot poker and apply it directly to the wound without the luxury of any painkillers. Obviously, this would be extremely painful. Would I rather bleed out? Or have this done? I honestly don't know. However, it would probably result in infection if not treated properly, especially considering that they didn't wash their damn hands as we found out in the previous video. But they wouldn't just use hot pokers for blood wounds, they would also use them to burn off hemorrhoids and STDs and I don't know, hopes and dreams. It was a bad time. Number eight, clamshell hair removal. Whew, here we go. Nowadays you can laser off any unwanted hair. Waxing as well, sounds like an absolute nightmare, but compared to how it used to be done, it's still our best method today. Looking back to around 100,000 years ago, long before Gillette had their nine blade razors with cooling gels and all that good shit, we had to use seashells, literal, Seashells, and when I say seashells, I don't mean they would glide across the skin and you know, Sweeney Todd themselves. No, they would use two shells and then put them together as tweezers and pluck the hairs out one by one. Seashells, can you hear that? It's the sound of our ancestors plucking their eyebrows. They're still screaming. Sharpened clam shells were used later in the 19th century and we realized if they're flat enough, we can swipe them off. So they were sharpening shells. Eventually they got to the gliding technique. Saves time, but still it was horrible. And if that sounds bad, 30,000 years ago, we used flint blades to shave. Yeah, just remember, when you nick yourself, it can always be better. Number seven, mouse skins. It honestly seems like we really can't get our eyebrows right. In the early 2000s, they were plucked within an inch of their life. Today, we have brow pencils, waxing, soap brows, which I really don't understand. Back in Elizabethan times, they were plucked entirely off of the face to make foreheads look bigger. And now there's this trend. Eventually, bountiful eyebrows came back into fashion, and for those women who weren't blessed with such brows, resorted to mouse traps. That's right, in order to get that luscious furry frame above their eyes, they would catch mice, skin them, and apply them to their eyes. Yay. In the 17th and 18th century, more specifically, women of nobility were known for shaving off their eyebrows entirely and stick on the mouse skin. It was better if the mice had really dark fur because the popular look of the time was pale skin and black eyebrows. Gee, I wonder where Snow White came from. But even more hilariously, <laughs> They would place their brows higher than normal so they walked around looking surprised all the time. Imagine one of them receiving the worst news possible while simultaneously looking like they just won the lottery. Also, the glue wasn't very good, so they would fall off at leisure. Your mom died. Oh no, like what the heck? Number six, horsehair dental floss. Yeehaw, okay, despite how annoying dentists can be sometimes, flossing is vital when it comes to mouth cleanliness. But using horses' hairs to do so, that just sounds counterproductive, no? Early human remains were studied and it showed these grooves in between their teeth. So they would sharpen these little sticks on both sides or use horse hair to get those hard to reach places. Even back then, way in ancient times. If it wasn't horse hair, it was thin, long twigs. Honestly, I'd rather use the twigs. At least that has like a scent of some sort. I don't know, like mint, minto green, something like that, horse. 
back? No. It really wasn't until 1815 until a New Orleans dentist named Levi Spear started to use silk thread to floss in between the teeth instead of hair. Thank you, Levi. As fun as horse hair flossing sounds, I'm gonna stick to the spearmint. Spearmint, Levi Spear. Wait a minute. Number five, crocodile done the deed. Again, I'm saying this again. Who had the gall? Who had the damn audacity to look at a steaming pile of, of digested animal excrement and go, you know, that will work for Insert problem here. Once again, I put the question, how the heck did we survive? But nevertheless, we are here once again to bring to you yet another animal poop cure-all. And this time it was for contraception. Yes, in ancient Egypt, women would use crocodile dung as a contraceptive. Yay! Now, crocodiles were worshipped and sacred to the ancient Egyptians, so that could be one reason why they thought it would help. They would mix it with sour milk, sour milk, <sighs> to make it a pasty kind of poop dough with a hope that would create an acidic barrier to sperm. Kind of like a dungy version of a diaphragm or a cap used today, but covered in spermicide. We had to start somewhere, but I honestly can't think of a better way to kill the mood. Hold on, honey. Gotta shove some poop out there. Number four, sulfur for freckles. Ooh, this next one gets me hot. This next one is, hits too close to home. Sorry, frecklers. I love my freckles. Every summer they pop harder and harder, better, faster, and stronger. I love them. But back in the day, there were some pretty insane methods to get rid of them. I know, get rid of them. How could you, right? How dare you? Having freckles in ancient Roman days meant you couldn't participate in your favorite magical rituals. <laughs> Yeah, sorry Balthazar, I'll catch the next meeting, I guess. I'm gonna go wash up. Having freckles meant you were impure or polluted. And in ancient Greece, having a beauty mark or a thousand on your face or cheek meant a bright future was in store for you. So, depends really where I am, but kinda, I'm like, huh? Medieval Europe, moles or freckles meant that you were for sure a witch. Great. That one, they're kinda, they're, they're onto something a little bit. I got witchy vibes. Ancient China, if you had a red or black mole, that was actually a good sign, but a brown mole, like this one, meant grave warning signs. E. So depending where and when you were, that freckle that you named when you were seven could have possibly changed your entire life. In places where freckles weren't desirable, sulfur was used daily to get rid of them. We don't recommend lathering your face with sulfur. In fact, I think magical rituals are safer. Number three, Versailles and other palaces. Did anyone else imagine when they were a kid that they were born in the wrong era and should have been like prouncing around in golden embroidered gowns and palaces or being in a masquerade decked in velvet across the room from your secret lover? <laughs> Some more than most. Except there is a lot missing from that fantasy, specifically the smell. You'd think a place like Versailles with like halls of mirrors and lots of gold everywhere would be like the cleanest place to live in the 18th century, but the reality was stomach churning. Remember that red velvet dress? Well that hadn't been washed in god knows how long and you were stuffed in a room with people wearing the same thing and everywhere was a toilet. That's right, nobles didn't wait to empty themselves in a chamber pot or bathroom of some kind. Versailles was their toilet. They would relieve themselves in empty fire pits, imagine if it was occupied, in the stairwell, behind doors, wherever they felt. Sounds too ridiculous to be true? <laughs> well, take this 1675 report of the Louvre Palace in Paris and I quote, on the grand staircases, behind the doors, and almost everywhere one sees, there are massive excrement, one smells a thousand unbearable stenches caused by calls of nature, which everyone goes to do there every day." Unquote. Things got so bad in other palaces, Henry VIII even had to decree that cooks in the royal kitchen were forbidden to work naked. Why were they working naked? I don't know. Or in garments of such vileness as they do. So as for my first point, I think I was born in precisely the right era. Number two, finger food. You ever go to somebody's house for dinner and they have like 15 forks laying in front of you, just way too many utensils for no reason. That's why I like nachos, okay? It's not intimidating. Burgers aren't intimidating. You can just eat with your hands and get messy. It's easier. It's way more fun as well just to dive in and make an absolute mess. Like medieval times, for example, they had cutlery, but you had to be somebody fancy to have it. Most of the population, being poor and all, had to eat with their hands. 
Chopsticks were first used during the Shang Dynasty, the oldest chopsticks ever found went as far back as 3000 BC. But come 400 AD, China's population spiked, resulting in a lack of resources for food. These stirring sticks now got a lot smaller to fit for their smaller portions, and that was the start of chopsticks. Fun fact. Come the 16th century, the rich and fancy carried their own set of forks with them to their royal dinner. King Charles V of France had a vault a vault with a few forks in it. He's like, hey, check this one out. Bing. That's how rare that kind of metal work was back in medieval times. I bring plastic forks to work. Does that count for something? I have like two in my backpack, maybe three. Number one, and last but not least, a gong farmer. Adding to that fantasy I spoke about earlier, living in a castle with a glistening, sparkling moat. What moat could you want? Well, I'm sorry to say that moats often doubled as toilets. Very often when castles were built, the toilets would be built high up in the castle hanging over the moat so that it would just drop right in there. But another way they would deal with their droppings was to build a toiletry over a cesspit, kind of like an outhouse, or kind of exactly like an outhouse. Except at one point, the cesspit would fill up, enter the hero of the hour. Today, we have people with machines who do it, Somebody actually had to go in there and do it himself with their bare hands. Friends, remove your hats in honor of the gong farmer. Their job was to get on in there, shovel it out by hand, and ferry it to a spot where they could bury it. It was a dangerous job for a multitude of reasons. The top ones including the pits were often riddled with disease, and they were often quite deep. So as a result, they were paid very well for the time to sweeten the fact that no one would go near them, so they would be forever alone. But even then, lives were lost. One man by the name of Richard the Raker fell into one and drowned. What a way to go. Kicking off the list at number 10, wiper no wiping. On part three of the series, we of course brought up the worst job in royal history, the groom of the stool. Wiping was a royalty. We didn't have the fluffy bear family telling us to hashtag enjoy the go, where they used an incredible amount, just a wasteful amount of toilet paper. Those bears, so wasteful. We had to improvise back then and use leaves. And by we, I mean medieval peasants, not us. We discussed Romans just pooping through cold cement benches, but what did they use to wipe after the fact? Well, that was the sponge on the stick method, which I'll be honest, that's my favorite of the ancient methods. Cause you know somebody had the perfect stick, right? Like one that was like, hm, hm, just the perfect angle to really get in there. No, the sponge on the stick wasn't that fun at all. It was actually communal, it was all bad. You had to share it, be like, oh, okay. Here you go, sir. Early Americans used brick-lined pits, and that was their washrooms. This was around the time of the Declaration of Independence, and besides human waste, people would dump anything in these toilets. They found a window in one of these pits. A window. Some poor guy hit a window. Can you believe that? And as for wiping, are you ready? Dried corn on the cob, that's what they would use. Yeah, man, next time you do that corn on the cob butter trick where you like spin it through the butter, all nice and smooth, keep that in mind. Number nine, just pull it. We've talked about brushing your teeth with urine, we've talked about using horsehair for dental floss, but can it get even more bizarre when it comes to oral cleanliness? Yes. We still do this method today. If a tooth is beyond repair or it's causing an infection in your jaw, yeah, just pull that sucker out. See ya. Sometimes it's the only option. Sometimes. Back in the day though, this was the best and only method. Sore tooth, maybe a cavity, something's not feeling right, maybe your gums are just hurting, maybe you bit down on a bone, no problem. Pull it, no matter what the case is, just <laughs> yank it out. Dentists weren't a thing in the Middle Ages. Dr. Downer didn't politely remind you to floss more, you know what I'm saying? But they did have a barber, the fastest dentist in the game. Barbers are responsible for obviously cutting hair, but they too would pull teeth and they would bloodlet. This guy must have been in the weeds every single day. He was so busy. Yeah, just a little off the top, maybe a little bit of blood at this, a couple of molars too, classic three in one appointment, you're good, debit. If you walked into the barber shop and you were bald, he already knew what was up. He was like, all right, I'm gonna start warming up the arm here. And if you think that's weird, well, let's go a little bit more recent for this one. Number eight, Doormad toothpaste. We've mentioned some horrible lipsticks and face powders, so we need to mention this disaster of a brand. Moving past the days where your barber pulls out the problem in the 1940s, we had toothpaste. Yes, we had it, this is good. In fact, we had the most powerful toothpaste ever to this day. It was called Doramad. Okay, yeah, so back in the 40s, people were brushing with radiation. Even on the actual tube, it says, radioactive ingredients increase the defense of teeth and gums. Okay. These cells are loaded with new life energy. The bacteria is hindered and they're destroying effect, leaving behind a pleasant, mild, refreshing taste. Ah, yummy. 
Its radioactivity was low in comparison, but the fact that this existed once, not too long ago, is just wild to me. Good gums don't bleed, they actually glow. What would their slogan be today? Doramad, accelerate your breath. Number seven. Shards and Shards. Oh, you thought we were done with the bum bum history. Eh, think again. This is a part four, and honestly, I could do four more parts on wiping alone. It's a pretty big deal, it's nuts. We don't realize how lucky we are. During the pandemic, for example, one of the first things people stocked up on was toilet paper. It's worrisome to not have six rolls on standby. You start getting anxious, right? You're like, oh, but what if I eat some lobster? I don't know, whatever makes your tummy upset. Now you know a little bit more about me. But nobody did it like the ancient Greeks, and I mean nobody. Survey says ancient Greeks would wipe using broken pieces of ceramic. Oh my god. They would even sometimes write the names of their enemas, I mean enemies, on this piece of shard and then wipe. Isn't that wild? It's like, ah, I'll show you by wiping with ceramic with your name on it. <laughs> gotcha. Yes, this obviously led to major health problems and according to the British medical journals, three pieces was often enough. Three is still a good number today. That's a comfortable fold, but ceramic, no, there's no way. No way. It was the better alternative, believe it or not. The other was actually sharp seashells. Number six, deodorant. Before the Old Spice guy was even born, what did people do to smell good? What? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s. It was called mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide and it was stored in metal cold containers. Nothing like speed stick at all, not even close to being discreet. You can't put the stuff on the bus. It's not, they're gonna be, what's that guy doing with that jar of goop? Ancient Egyptians used ostrich eggs when it came to ancient deodorant. They made perfumes and were amongst the first to try any type of deodorant. So thank you. Thank you. Hence the ostrich egg factor. Mixing a little fat, tamarisk, tortoise shells, nuts, and then bam, you're ready for the day. Another method was a little more yummy than ostrich eggs and nuts. Egyptians would also use porridge balls. Flavored porridge rolled up and then safely secured in your little apple pitter fritters right there. Just don't wave at anybody or else you'll, mm, there you go. Number five. Shampoo. When my hair grew longer over the pandemic, I had a huge wake-up call. I had no idea what I was doing. I only used the guy's shampoo, you know, like the classic four-in-one shampoos. That wasn't working anymore. I needed some curl cream. I needed shampoo and conditioner, separate things. It takes time to figure out what works with your flow, but the ancient Romans, they didn't have head and shoulders. They would just dip their hair in cold water at a public bathhouse, also very public, and then rub and scrape oils away. Lime wire was also used to wash your hair back then, but that was horrible. It's just as useful as lime wire. Sometimes Europeans wouldn't even use water at all. They would just rub their head with bran before bed and then brush it out with a comb in the morning. Yeah, bran. I used dog shampoo once by accident. Honestly, guys, I'm not gonna lie. There's something they're not telling us. It was too nice. Number four, aqua tofana. Not to be confused with Aquafina, which is also pretty horrible, Aquatafina was hot in the 17th century. This was a straight up poison that was marketed as a cosmetic. This was during the late 1600s and it was first used by two women, Francesca Lasarda and Teofania Di Amato. They used this cosmetic, this makeup, so that when their husbands kissed them on the cheek, they would then be poisoned. It's named after its creator, a lady named Tofania, who was caught and executed for her crimes, but her recipe carried on through who we believe was her daughter, Yulia Tofana. She took this deadly recipe all the way to Rome and then kept manufacturing it. Inside this cursed cosmetic was arsenic, lead, and perhaps belladonna. It was colorless, tasteless, and one of the deadliest. This cosmetic took over 600 lives. Brutal. Number three, baldness. So what if you're going bald, but you don't have a massive 16th century stupid wig, then what do you do? Well, back in those days, if your hair started to thin out or you were losing patches, you would need a mix of chicken droppings. Yeah, chicken mixed with potassium. Okay, this ancient advice comes from a man named Peter Levins. He wrote this method down in 1654 as an alternative to lice-infected wigs. Both sound absolutely horrible. Honestly, I think I'd rather the lice-infected wig. At least then you can just take it off. Number two, sailor's delight. Life on the sea was all but a sea breeze. And even today, you know how hard it is to take a on a boat? Whale watching's fun and games until your stomach decides it's had enough of the sea and wants to go home. While it's a rockin' and rollin' way of using the loo, how did sailors do it back in the day before anything helpful? Was it easier being far away from the general public? Was it helpful that water was all around the place? Honestly, not really. That's when a tow rag comes into play. Yeah, anytime the word rag is used, you're not in for a good time. Near the head of the ship where the toilet was, this little indent or whatever the toilet, it wasn't a toilet, it was a hole, there was a single rope with a rag, and when it wasn't being used, or shared rather, the rag would be tossed over the side of the ship so it would just dangle in the water and wash away all day, which is fine, 
I think, I'm not really sure. The sharing is caring thing, I'm not on board for, pun intended. Do you fold, do you scrunch, or do you use barnacle rope? How do you do it, guys? Comment down below. Number one, Q-tips. I love Q-tips a lot. I do two at the same time, and then I flip them, and then I do it again. Yeah, I get them twice. The first one for cleanliness, and the second one because it's for me, because I feel like it. Sue me. My eyes roll right back, it's the best. If COVID tests were done through your ear, I'd be getting tested twice a day just for fun. Q-tips, most of us know by now, weren't exactly made for cleaning your ears. As much as we only use them for that, Q-tips were invented in 1923 by a man named Leo Gergenzang after his wife stuck cotton balls to the end of a toothpick. Sounds a lot like she invented Q-tips, but sure, we'll roll with it. From 1923 to 1926, they were named Baby Gays, and then Q-tip Baby Gays, and then finally just Q-tips. Baby Ray's is like, mm, too close. Sweet Baby Ray's is like, way too close. Our, our sauce is not even close to that product. Back in those days, Q-tips were actually dipped in boric acid first before being shipped out. They were intended to sterilize wounds. After this, there was even Q-soaps, Q-oils, Q-creams, Q-cards, whatever, you name it. Anything that made you a QT. Mm. So what's this rumor that they're not supposed to be used in your ears? Like, sorry, what? What's that all about? Is that real? Well, in 2008, autologist Dennis Fitzgerald brought forward concerns about Q-tips and how they're really pushing earwax further into your ear canal, leading to possible infections. When Chesborough Ponds bought the company in 1962, they added the warning on the box. A warning we all gladly will still ignore, like I said at the beginning. Mm. I take one look at my earbuds and I'm like, yeah, I need four Q-tips right away. I need Q-tips yesterday. Kicking off the list at number 10, Hot Topics. Over in Finland, they're changing the game. The sauna over there is considered a national institution. It's a large part of both Finnish and Estonian cultures. These saunas are commonly found surrounding Finland's lakes, corporate headquarters, and, oh yeah, of course, the parliament house. Saturday in Finland is traditional sauna day. It's not Saturday for the boys, it's just Saturday and we're gonna, we're gonna breathe in each other's mouths for a bit. I can't even fit into a bathtub. I look like an octopus trying to escape a jar. It's not relaxing, it's not a good Saturday at all. I wanna move to Finland. When government leaders can't agree on an issue, they take it to the sauna. How amazing does that sound? In the middle of passing a bill, dudes will just pause and then go hit the sauna. We need this over here. Finns describe the sauna as a secret weapon behind their diplomatic advances. Director of the Finnish Employers Confederation described the ritual saying that it's easier to discuss problems openly. It's like when we're doing a presentation in class, they always say to imagine everybody naked. Well, this was just that scenario played out in real life. Take away the briefcase and tie, you're just a naked dude sitting on a bench talking about inflation. Kind of an odd picture when you think of it. Number nine, the outhouse. One thing I am glad I don't have to deal with anymore is outhouses. Not that I ever did, it's just something I don't want to do. I called the chief again last night and uh, he said it wasn't it, again. Outhouses have been around for a long time. Technically just a hole in the ground where the business is done. It wasn't until later a small wood shack was built around said hole. And then it became an outhouse. Because the design of the outhouse is quite simple, there is a few design flaws that really just don't make any sense. Okay, yeah, it had to be built away from the house, as it is a pit full of refuse that exit a human being. But it's also built away from your house. So if you gotta go bad, I mean, you gotta go bad. You might not make it. This also is not so fun if you live in a place where it's cold and you have to dress just to take a leak. But really what is the craziest thing is that after a certain time, that hole is going to fill up with an unholy godliness I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy. And now you gotta move it somewhere else. I know they wouldn't fill up that fast, but after a few years living in the same place, there'd be a few holes everywhere and that's, that's just not good decoration, is it? Not to mention, if you were living in the time of the expanding west, an unseen rattlesnake or scorpion could make the potty time your last. I'll just stay indoors, thanks. Number eight, there's not a visine for that. Does anybody else sneeze when they look at the sun, or is that just me? Do I have issues? I have a handful of allergies, and one of them apparently is a star. That's neat. My eyes are literally always dry. I think I forget to blink. I'm not really sure what's going on. But today, there's a visine, luckily, for everything. Eye drops are common, but written in the oldest book of medicine, the Evers Papyrus, chock full of ancient Egyptian medical recipes, it contained old optical treatment. Even in Egyptian artwork, you can find ancient cataract treatments. British archaeologist Austin Henry Layard found these clay tablets from ancient Babylonia around 625 BC, and treatment for dry eyes was a little different than today. Today, all you have to do is and you're good. Back then, you had to get chemicals from plants and then mix them with prayers. Good game, good luck. One ancient tablet described the treatment of the time saying, if a man's eyes are affected with dryness, he shall rub an onion 
and then drink a beer and then apply oil to his eyes. Just mix all that sh put it in your mouth, and then thou shalt disembowel a yellow frog mixed in its gall and curd and apply it to its eyes. I don't even know what the f that means. Like imagine getting that on a prescription, you're like a yellow frog, what? Number seven. One night with Venus, two years with Mercury. It wasn't too long after humans discovered toe curling that as much fun as that may be, there can be some unfortunate side effects. Knowing somebody in the biblical sense can transmit not so fun diseases if you catch my drift. Like syphilis, early stages being sores and uncomfortable rashes, late stages having much more serious side effects like blindness, heart disease, and oh yeah, it can make you go crazy. So throughout history and especially before there was antibiotics, how do you treat a disease so common amongst people participating in the devil's dance? Liquid mercury, yep. People try to treat a disease by consuming liquid mercury. When applied to the skin, it burned. Therefore, if it hurts, it works. It was noted that syphilis would go away after mercury treatments, but this could have just been a stage of the bedroom rodeo disease as its symptoms disappear right before things get bad. This is also assuming that people taking mercury aren't getting sick of mercury poisoning in the first place. This practice continued way longer than it should have as it wasn't until discoveries made in the 1900s that a better option for treating the brothel related illness. Honestly, with this kind of logic, anything's possible. Sky's the limit when you're crazy. Number six, the great stink of 1858. It's one thing living through a pandemic, but at least we're not living through something called the great stink. Yeah, the great stink of 1858. Who was responsible for this? What did you eat? What happened? Well, this was an event in central London and it lasted for a few months in the summertime too, which is just great for great stinks. It was so hot and dry that the Thames dried up leaving just sewage, just all that gross you can imagine. The smell was so bad, Parliament had to close for an entire day. I wanna know who the first guy was to be like, you know what, nah, I'm going home. This sucks, this sucks. Good call. In order to continue work, Parliament had to soak the curtains on the riverside of the building in lime chloride just so they wouldn't be sick. They just soak it in chloride to be like, that's better, it's better, we think. They were on the verge of moving their entire operation to Oxford, that's how bad it was. Members of the committee were quitting their jobs. While this sounds all bad, hundreds of tons of limes were being discharged into sewers to help the smell. So if you had a stuffy nose in July 1858, you could have made 1,500 pounds a week just messing around with limes. You missed your shot. Number five, the human fly trap. This is honestly so five head, a brilliant play might be one of the best moves I've ever seen. Have you ever been to a picnic with a nice sandwich, some fresh crisp potato chips, and an ice cold lemonade as you sit on a warm blanket, enjoying the view just over yonder? When all of a sudden you are attacked by a swarm of bugs that just ruin the vibes, and now you don't even want the sandwich. Who made this lemonade? It's so bitter. I don't even like chips. The pharaohs of ancient Egypt felt the same way, except they had a great way to deal with it. Simply take a few of my servants and slather them in honey. Place them away from our royal picnic and bada bing, bada boom, you got no more flies bothering you or your sandwich. This honestly sounds completely cruel and at a time when hygiene in general wasn't great, how did they get all that honey off? Sure, a dip in the Nile will get rid of most of it, but you'd probably just glaze yourself for a crocodile's lunch. Honey will get stuck in places where the sun don't shine. And just like shame, you can never really wash it off. Number four, ancient sunscreen. As soon as summer comes around, game over, honey. I burn so easily. I have freckles for two days, then the rest is just red and un, just bad, all bad. That's why I'm a fan of winter. I don't have to keep applying sunscreen to my face all day and feel like I'm about to faint. But how did Egyptians beat the heat in ancient times? They didn't have Banana Breeze SPF 35. What did they do? Well, ancient Egyptians valued their skin as a symbol of beauty. You think your morning skincare routine requires a lot of work? Yeah, buckle up. Their routine was written on a tomb wall and also scrolls. They used rice bran containing UV absorbing gamma orizinol and that was used to block the sun off. Jasmine as well helped repair sun damage. To some chick named Jasmine, she was like, don't look at it, just stop. Ancient Greeks used olive oil as sunscreen, which as far as UV protection goes, did absolutely next to nothing. You'd be burnt and dehydrated, but you know what? Can line, so. Number three, Red Dead Bandage. America, 1864. There's a polite disagreement between North and South whether the South should be still using YouTube's least favorite S word as a business practice. The verdict, it wasn't very nice. That aside, the Southern states fought hard for a very stupid reason, idiots. Such a hard fight in the fact that it was taking a serious toll on everyone. 
specifically the southern economy and civilians who got caught in the raw end of the deal. The war was a huge cost of life and money for both sides, but the south just didn't have the same resources the north did. So, after years of fighting, things weren't looking too good. An example of this was the south washing and reusing bandages as supplies were low and casualties were high. This might be hard to stomach, but that's just what happened. Nurses washed the blood off of blood soaked rags and bandages to reuse simply because there was no supply. I don't have to be a doctor to tell you that reusing bandages in a time before antibiotics is a bad idea. It might be better to just not have a bandage in that case at all, as the chance for infection would significantly increase. Dutch, you got any fresh band aids over there? I scraped my knee fight with Micah. Hurts real bad. Maybe get John to kiss my boo boo better. Number two. Ancient socks. Somebody got me socks as a gift over the holidays and let me tell you, still the best thing you can get. Socks and lip balm, you can do anything you want. Game over. Socks in ancient Greece were not the right and left neon green athletic socks that you have today. No, not even close. Socks came around in the 8th century BC, made fresh from, you guessed it, animal hairs. Yeah, it was gross. This actually led to Romans tying animal skins around their feet and then tying them up. Cut to the 2nd century AD in ancient Rome, the sock game got real. Romans began using fabrics instead of animal skins and it was softer, lighter, and all that jazz. And then later on in the 5th century, socks were worn only by the most holy. Socks were associated with the church. They were considered a symbol of purity. Yeah, you heard it. Socks would go all the way up to your leg. A little different than the New Balance ones we have now that just go up to your ankle that, you know, fall off when you're halfway to work and then make you really upset. I have one right now. I'm going to go figure it out. Number one, heavy stomach. We as humans need food and water to live. Water honestly being number one. I mean, I could eat a little bit more, but water's more important. But it is what it is sometimes. People in the past had no choice but to build water pipes out of lead. Sure, maybe it wasn't common knowledge that the lead was toxic, but a lot of people did know. So that's why all the cities that sparked up during the Industrial Revolution were built with such. Lead as a material did make sense, as it was cheap and easy to use. So that simply outweighed the health risk of lead poisoning. Lead was a common material in other products as well. But when your drinking water is supposed to be fresh, maybe it's time to spend a little more so we don't end up, you know, spending a lot more on healthcare for lead poisoning. After years of being underground, the pipes corrode and leak toxins into the water stream. It's why in older cities, a lot of time and money is spent today replacing old pipe infrastructure. To me, it's a classic case of, eh, let somebody else deal with them, sure it's fine. Well, I'm off to go work in a completely safe asbestos factory, I'm sure there's nothing wrong or bad in there. <laughs> At number 10, painting veins. Back in the 17th century in Europe, many people believed that extreme paleness was just the hottest thing. If you looked whiter than a ghost, then you were like the Megan Fox of the town. Many women were obsessed with finding new ways of making themselves look pastier than a white wall, and some of their methods were actually surprisingly creative. The cosmetic skills of women back then were actually pretty impressive, I must say. Wealthy aristocratic women were the ones who took part in this pale trend the most. They wore dresses with plunging neck lines to show off the girls and they painted themselves white using a powder. Frankly, this powder made them look pretty artificial, like you could tell that they weren't actually naturally that white, so to solve this they came up with a new beauty trend, drawing veins. Women would draw veins on their mommy milkers using a blue color to mimic the look of translucent skin. It's crazy to think how far we've come from this, because back then people were trying to look as pale as possible and now we have people tanning themselves so much that it causes controversy. At number 9, tiny tea. During the Renaissance, fashion and beauty standards were changed drastically from what was popular in the years before. So much in society changed over this period of time, like what was seen as beautiful or desirable. Things like certain body types and other physical attributes had their own trends, but one of the weirdest physical beauty trends from back then had to do with teeth. Back then, the ideal woman had wide hips, a small waist, long legs, and small teeth. Yeah. Teeth had an ideal size. To people back then, the smaller the teeth, the more desirable you were. Why? I don't know, because people are weird, I guess. Some people would even go as far as to file their teeth down to make them smaller so that people would see them as more attractive. Now, I can imagine that this would be a very painful process. Like if you've ever chipped a tooth, then you know that uncomfortable, almost cold sensation of a broken tooth. So imagine that, but on all of your teeth. Yeah, you can count me out. Before we carry on talking about some of these strange things people did to be the belle of the ball, and yeah, there were some really, really weird things, why not take a moment to leave a like on this video if you're enjoying it so far, and while you're at it, consider subscribing to the channel to see more videos like this one. At number 8, Nails for Days. 
These days, people get their nails done all the time. I love seeing crazy nail art videos online because they're often so creative. Some of the most fascinating ones are the crazy long nails. I don't think I could ever rock those, but I still admire those who can. The beauty trend of having long nails though isn't a new thing. It's been a symbol of beauty and status for many, many years like years ago in China. Back then, having super long nails was seen as a way to show off your wealth and status. The average nail length amongst Chinese aristocrats was up to 25 centimeters or nearly 10 inches. This was all their natural nails too. And in order to protect their insanely long nails from breaking, they wore nail guards made out of gold. Not only did that protect their nails, but it was also another way of showing off their wealth because not everyone can live their lives wearing gold cages on their fingers. As you can imagine, having nails that long made it so you could barely do anything with your hands, and so that's why these aristocrats had servants, so they could perform the tasks that someone with super long nails couldn't. But would you ever want to have nails that long? <laughs> At number seven, long neck style. In many cultures around the world and for many years, having a long neck was considered beautiful and so many women practice neck stretching in order to attain this level of beauty. This practice of neck stretching has been most commonly done by wearing metal rings around the neck, adding more and more rings over time. This practice was first seen sometime around the 11th century in Southeast Asia. The theory behind the rings is that they're so thick that they push the head up, therefore stretching the neck, but in actuality, the lengthening of the neck is caused by the rings pushing down on the collarbones. The origin of this practice is pretty much unknown, but it is theorized that it began as a way to make women look more attractive in order to prevent getting captured as slaves. But on the other hand, some people believe that this was a way of protecting people from getting attacked by tigers. Two very different theories, but nonetheless valid. Though this practice began so long ago, it is still a traditional body modification in some parts of the world to this day. At number six, tiny tootsies. For many years, having the tiniest feet was seen as a popular beauty trend in China. Foot binding was a big body modification practice in China that began in the 10th century AD. It is said that this whole trend started because a court dancer bound her feet and the emperor at the time, Emperor Li Yu, really liked what he saw and soon it was encouraged for other women to do the same. Soon this practice of foot binding became a huge trend and it became associated with being able to find a husband. The practice of foot binding began when a girl was 5 or 6 years old. They would have their feet put in hot water, have their nails cut short, and have their skin rubbed with oil before having their four smallest toes broken, folded over, and tied down. Then their feet would be bent in the middle to break the arch, and the girl would have to walk around like that over time, crushing the heel and sole of the foot. After about two years, the foot would be considered ready, and depending on the size of the girl's foot by the end, this would judge how easily she'd be able to be matched with a good husband. This practice continued all the way until the 20th century, where it started to lose popularity. At number five, long skulls. One of the most bizarre beauty trends from ancient times, at least, was the process of head shaping. This unusual beauty trend caused people in modern times to think that aliens were real when remains were discovered with oddly shaped skulls. Some people believe that we had proven the existence of extraterrestrials, but in reality it led to the discovery of an entire practice of human body modification for the purpose of beauty. The process of head shaping involves putting some kind of pressure on a baby's head so that it grows into a different shape. This was known to be done by using cloth or even boards to create the desired shape. This is one of the oldest beauty trends in history as the earliest evidence of modified skulls come from Australia and date back between 14,000 and 9,000 years ago. The skulls that were found had flattened foreheads and very prominent brow ridges. This practice also occurred quite often in South America where skulls with a variety of different shapes have also been found. I'm kind of glad that we don't do this anymore because I could not imagine going through life with a cone head. I wonder how it would feel to have a head shaped like that. My neck hurts just thinking about it. Hi number four. Five head. Let's go back to the Renaissance for a bit to talk about yet another one of their super strange beauty trends. They really had a lot of weird desires when it came to appearances, and I'm certainly glad that this next one is no longer in style, and I really hope it never makes a comeback. Back in the Renaissance, it was believed that girls with high curved foreheads were the most beautiful, but obviously not everyone can be built like that. As people do, they came up with a way of achieving this look without having to be born with said attributes. In order to have that big forehead that people so desire, Desired, women were known to have shaved or plucked the hairs from their natural hairline to make their foreheads look bigger and therefore more desirable. They really said, receding hairline, but make it fashion. That's 
suppose. At number three, feet painting. Now you would think that all of the super bizarre beauty trends of the past were from way back in the day, but you would be mistaken. We saw some strange practices in the 20th century as well, especially during war times. Back in World War II, a shortage of silk and nylon in America created a bizarre beauty trend. Because these materials were needed to make things like parachutes and uniforms for troops, tights were quickly disappearing from stores. Because this was such a huge staple in women's fashion, they got creative and created a beauty trend where women would draw pantyhose arrows in their legs, dye them with different colors, and try and mimic the look of mesh tights to create an illusion close to wearing stockings. I feel like if this happened in today's time, I don't think I would be that desperate to do that, and you couldn't catch me drawing or dyeing my legs for this. I think I'll just stick to wearing pants. Item number two, strange corsets. Corsets have been around for a long time. They've come in and out of style, and even right now, corsets seem to be making their way back into mainstream fashion, though maybe not as extreme as back in the day. In the 19th century, having an hourglass figure was seen as the ideal body type, and so in order for many women to achieve this look, they wore corsets to cinch their waist. However, the looks were pretty extreme. Some women tightened their corsets so tight that their waist could be wrapped with two hands. Like, imagine that. Although this was seen as super chic back in the day, it was also causing some health issues because it would squish together people's organs, and as you can imagine, that's not a good thing. Eventually, corsets evolved so that rather than cinch the waist so much, it would just accentuate the hips to still give an hourglass shape without causing too much bodily harm. And finally, at number one, no-no piercings. How many of you guys out there have piercings? I have a few myself, I have my ears pierced, and obviously my nose is pierced, but there are so many other places that you can get pierced even in the no-no region. Back in the Victorian era, piercings down under were pretty popular and were considered to be very fashionable amongst wealthy women. Some women would have their nippies pierced and even chained together, and some men would even get their peepees some jewelry too. For women, it was all about trends, but for men back then, many of them got their nether regions pierced supposedly to make wearing tight pants pants more comfortable. This piercing was called the Prince Albert, and it was given that name based on the legend that Prince Albert got his little prince pierced in order to hide the size of his junk underneath his clothes. Whether or not that's actually true is beyond me, but I would imagine that getting that piercing would be painful. Absolutely painful. But remember, in the wise words of Beyonce, pretty hurts. Oh boy, was she right. Number 10, wash your hands. No, seriously, go go wash your hands right now. When was the last time you washed those filthy mess? Go wash your hands. Washing your hands is super important, especially these days. But something that's very unusual about the Aztecs compared to a lot of other civilizations in history is that, well, they did wash their hands. Oh, and you have no idea how happy that makes me. No more shall I have to think about people shaking hands after using the bathroom with no toilet paper. That's disgusting. Or scooping food onto a plate with their bare, dirty hands and sharing that food with the rest of their families. Yes, the Aztecs like to wash their hands before and after a meal, which is just the way it should be. I hate having grimy hands. You know, I talked to the chief today, and you know what he said? That's it. That's actually it. Yeah, we like that. That's it. Number 9, Aztec Barbershop. It must have been quite the sight for Spanish conquistadors to land upon the shores of North America and then come to bear witness the Aztec civilization in all its glory. Something noticed by the curious Europeans was that the Aztecs had what looked like a barbershop for men. After all, a healthy scalp is a happy one. Even more interesting than that, however, is women were dyeing their hair with a green herb that I'm not even going to begin to pronounce. It was just too hard. It was a lot of X's and T's. I couldn't do it. Which produced a purple shine to their hair. Some women even shaved their hair off, while older women, like mothers, had longer hair. Man, it's almost as if a beautiful civilization was starting to flourish. Well, I'm sure nothing bad ever happens to the Aztecs, right? Number eight. My heroes. Let me create a scenario for you. I like creating scenarios. Let me create a scenario for you. You're on the way to a certain event that is very important in the big city. Maybe it's a new job, a new summer fling, or something that requires dry pants. But now your stomach is acting up. It's big angy. Your stomach's making sounds that are becoming more audible, and you can feel soon you will require a bathroom. But you hold it in. I can make it past this event and then go, you say to yourself, no problem. But now you've got cramps, sweats, and you're getting anxious, as you know that DEFCON 1 is approaching. 
You now have to make a decision to make a rush to find a bathroom or be late for your event or take a gamble with your underwear and dignity. Yes, that is a feeling I know all too well, but perhaps I should have been living in the Aztec Empire as they had public washrooms all over the city. That's just awesome. Oh, what sweet relief. As if that weren't the most unusual, they also had citizens cleaning the streets, which is pretty unusual for the time. Yes, cleanliness was very important to the Aztecs, and honestly, I think there should be public toilets on every street corner. Please, sometimes I gotta go. Number seven, thirsty. After a trip to the public washrooms, you may need a drink of water to rehydrate yourself. I mean, come on. I know I could use some hydration after that. Sometimes it gets really sweaty in there. Well, it's a good thing that the Aztec cities had canals. And not just the kind of canals a small Italian gentleman derives a boat through on Valentine's Day, but canals that handled both transportation and irrigation. Aztecs knew just how important water was for life, but perhaps most unusual about the Aztecs is their night soil collectors, which honestly sounds like it's hiding something just in that name. Night soil. Basically, they were beta garbage collectors who used canoes to transport this night soil to farms for fertilizer. And yes, night soil is exactly what you think it is. Poop! But it's unusual for a civilization to be so conscious of where their waste goes. Don't believe me? Well, how about this summer? We all get together, we all go up to New York City and take a dip in the Hudson River. Yeah, not many takers, didn't think so. They were doing their best with what they had. And if women don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. You know what I'm saying? Number six, ye olde dentistry. Look, every time I find a decent dentistry fact, I slap that bad boy in here like a D-based infomercial host with a surprisingly effective kitchen gadget. You're gonna love my nuts. Remember that guy? This is just one of those facts. Do I have a fear of the dentist? No. No, I don't, because my dentist is nice and has all the modern amenities to make me feel at ease. A comfy chair, laughing gas, and putting Peppa Pig on the TV because I'm a big baby. Goo goo gaga. However, no amount of any of those things I mentioned can prepare you for the dentistry before the year 1900. It was crude to say the least, but hygiene is hygiene, and you gotta keep that mouth fresh and clean. Tooth infections were fixed with rubbing charcoal in the affected area, and if that wasn't enough, a super safe mixture of snake venom and vinegar was used. What? I, okay. Who was the first guy that discovered snake venom had such healing properties? Probably the same weirdo who first milked a cow, if I had to guess. Aztec dentistry included fillings and tooth removal as well. Also, ladies of the evening dyed their teeth distinct colors, so then you know if you know. You know? Look at my red teeth, boys. Number five, steam baths. Now looking back and learning that the Aztecs had public washrooms everywhere and had access to steam baths because of their irrigation is fantastic. I mean, come on, just think about it. You could relax after a long day in your own steam bath that's made by natural running water. It sounds like doing yoga there would make me feel more in touch with my inner chakras. And my mood crystals would glow just a little bit brighter. Imagine, you walk into a bathhouse after a long day, and then you see me just sitting there with a towel that barely fits. Well, hey there, good looking. Why don't you come on in and pop a squat next to me? I promise I don't hog all the steam. <laughs> I know it sounds like an amazing time, right? The more we talk about the Aztecs, the more they sound like a perfect society. I wonder what happened to them. I'm sure it was nothing bad. They gotta be out there somewhere. Move over, fellas. I'm coming in for the steam. The steam was thought to have healing properties and was connected to their spirituality. Women even gave birth in the steam rooms, which feels like a really sweaty time. I just, I don't know about that. There's a lot of sweat. Number four, Bath and Body Works. It's clear the Aztecs were just cleaner than the other civilizations of the past, and honestly, I'm here for it. There's only so much a guy can say about people being stinky in the past. I mean, really, the smell must have been horrible, especially down in the nether regions. My lady, I would like to have a child with you, but the fragrance that is coming from both of our undercarriages makes me want to get into my carriage and drive it into the nearest body of water. Yes. Aztecs were making soap like it was their day job, using various herbs and plants to create much nicer smells and perfumes. However, during the rainy months, Aztecs wouldn't wash or wash their clothes in penance. But I guess one month isn't so bad. Strangely enough, women wouldn't wash their faces when men went off to war. I'm not sure about that one, but hey, I'll take it. Gold star for staying clean, Aztecs. Gold star. Number three, Bath and Body Works part two. Okay, another scenario. You're in the sixth grade. You're sitting at a desk and listening to Mrs. Smith, and she's going over what today's art assignment is. As you begin to reach for your favorite shade of red crayon, 
an odor hits your nose. It's unlike anything you've ever smelled before. And it's coming from your armpit. Puberty induced body odor. Not to worry, your buddy has a can of the finest spray deodorant there is. He hands you a black can that says Axe. You are now one of them. And you start showing up to school dances with a seafoam pink button up shirt with the collar popped and a Justin Bieber haircut with the hat on backwards. Yeah, that's right. All while drenched in a can of Axe's finest. Shark tooth necklace shows every girl in the room that you're a tough guy. God, those guys are the worst. Okay, no, the Aztecs didn't go that far, but they were aware of the horrors of the classroom BO and recommended a special bath prepared with lovely smelling aromas, which makes sense. Good smells go in, bad smells from your bum, they go out. However, there's two ingredients that make me question things. Apparently, no odor killing bath is complete without a fresh bone from a dog and a human. I'm just gonna leave that with you and think about how you'd feel with two bones floating in your bath. That's disgusting. Apparently, they had to be fresh too. That's gross. Number two, the Aztec classic. I'm glad the Aztecs had better hygiene because for once, I don't get super queasy talking about the things people did. However, it wouldn't be a video about Aztecs if I didn't talk about their favorite pastime. Sacrifice. And honey, if they were giving out gold medals for it, the Aztecs would be record breakers. Sure, they weren't the only civilization to sacrifice people, but they did it with such theatrics. It would make my old theater teacher very proud. But unlike most civilizations, the Aztecs did this all the time. Whenever the calendar called for one, it was time for one. And if they ran out of people, they would go grocery shopping for more. Or actually just go to war and take people, which is not good. Just know that when a chief or a religious leader cuts the heart out of a man whilst alive for the entire city to see, he most likely had a clean cloth and water to wash his hands, making modern surgeons proud everywhere. Number one, the European bug. It's safe to say that Aztecs, while not as clean as people today, they were striving for better hygiene, more than any other civilization at the time, really. However, no amount of hand washing, sacrificing, or putting herbs in your bath can prepare them for the Spanish. Not just the swords and the guns and invading and such, no, I mean the sickness that Europeans brought with them. It's a plot similar to War of the Worlds, except the invaders brought all the nasties with them. No matter what the Aztecs did, it wasn't going to stop the waves of lovely things the Europeans brought over. Armpits are clean, but now they got black lungs. There's too many diseases to even name, there's a lot. Number 10, snake eyes. Well, not exactly snake eyes, but after extended use of belladonna drops in the eyes, you would probably wish that a snake bit you in the eyes. Belladonna is poisonous. It's no calzone, red flag but yet it was still used by Egyptian royalty. Basically, the drops of poison would dilate your pupils, and that would be considered to be beautiful for some reason, I guess, okay. Extended use of the drops had terrible side effects for the user, blindness being one of them. You gotta remember, folks in this time have no social security, and the best doctors can do for you is tell you to go take a bath in crocodile dung and to pray to the gods for more, I guess. Sure, okay. So to avoid that tragedy, go for the natural look and avoid the eye drops. You'll thank me later. Number nine, more eye stuff. Thought I was done with the eye stuff? Ah, well, guess again, amigo. I ain't done yet. I've got lots more to say about that. Okay, maybe a little. Eyeshadow and eye color. Some ladies today would say no special outfit is complete without it. And honestly, I have to agree, ladies. Sometimes y'all do some stuff with your eyes that makes me say, damn, you look good. Damn, you look good. However, some ladies might be cautious to slap some color on their face if they knew the origins of the product. As for the royalty of Egypt, eye makeup was in. Seemed to be a trend. However, they weren't so cautious of where their makeup got its origins. Egyptian eye glitter had two key ingredients. Applicable powder and bugs. Yeah. You know the super colorful ones that are like really big and you wouldn't want to be around? Yeah, those, beetles, scarabs, and pretty much anything you could find. They would then crush them into a heavenly pulp and smear it all over their royal faces. I have issues with spiders and wasps, as it is. I have no interest in wearing them whatsoever. I actually hate wasps. That's just, you mean just crushing up a bunch of, and just, oh, this is good. Oh, I love this. This is the best. Yeah, no, don't do that. Number eight, sweet traps. When you're royalty of one of the most successful empires and civilizations in human history, it means you ain't gonna lift a finger. Less than any other celebrities do today, probably. So what to do with all that extra time in your hands instead of living like everyone else? Well, how about a picnic? That sounds nice, actually. Sounds great, right? Except when we bring out all of our favorite treats. The flies and bugs bother us, and we can't look beautiful if we're covered in bugs head to toe. How did the Egyptians fix this, you ask? Well, it's simple. 
don't let the bugs bite you in the first place. Basically, you get one of your forced volunteers, maybe a couple actually, and you slather the poor devils in honey till they look like your favorite pastry from Tim Hortons. Play said glaze serving away from the picnic and now you can enjoy it in sunshine and peace. The screaming of being eaten alive by bugs might dampen the mood, so just, just wear earplugs, it's fine. Just You stay over there and just get eaten, it's fine. No problem. No problem. Number seven, unhooded Sith. Circumcision is important in a lot of cultures of yesterday and today. Now at this channel, my job is to come out here every week and make you laugh. So to the men out there who still have their Jedi robes, imagine every day of your life you got sand in places that sand shouldn't be. Anakin Skywalker's worst nightmare and honestly explains why he hates sand so much. But perhaps one of the reasons Egyptians used this hygiene service was to stop sand getting in their wiener's one-eyed bandit. There's no showers, nothing to really get it out once it's in there. That's no good. I guess you could take a dip in the Nile River, but uh, there's too many crocodiles in there, and who has the time to jump in the Nile River when they're busy being forced to build large structures that will stand the test of time? So you better line up, fellas, or be cursed to feel like Anakin Skywalker for the rest of your life. The prequel one, too, not the, not the cool animated one, the one that whines a lot. That one. You don't want to be that one. Number six, nice dentist. Turns out not all Egyptian dentistry is completely awful. It turns out they may have come up with the first toothbrush. Other civilizations had examples of one too, so it's hard to tell exactly, but the Egyptians had one. But one thing they did have over everyone else were Tic Tacs, or breath mints, actually. Honestly, this makes a lot of sense. Imagine it was Valentine's Day. You just walked past a large pyramid. There's sand in places on your body where sand just shouldn't be. When you notice the smell of your breath, and it's something awful. But not to worry, because you purchased breath mints from the market. Yes, that's right. Now smooching with your Egyptian sweetheart can go on without a hitch. The mints were made from nice smelling herbs and mints, sometimes roasted over a fire to form little candies. An ancient Egyptian solution to an ancient Egyptian problem. I kinda like that one actually, kinda nice. Could put a mint in, it's kinda nice. Number five. Well, I didn't have any corn. Austin Powers reference for you. You know the character I'm talking about, I can't say it. Here's a hygiene product that just makes me question life. The very fabric of our existence. Whether it was the Big Bang or the Almighty Creator, there's just no way this was ever meant to happen. I just, it doesn't make any sense. One day, somebody was walking along the Nile River and was unfortunate enough to step in crocodile droppings. Now, most people would say, gross, and move on. Oh, no, not the people of ancient Egypt. They felt the stinky, squishy unholiness on their feet and said, yes, we must bathe in this. <laughs> and they did. They took the forbidden mud bath, the brown tsunami, the cesspit of no hope. You can call it whatever you want, really, it's, it's horrible either way you look at it. Supposedly it was meant to keep you young and beautiful. My only question would be at what point did they realize poo baths were a mistake? Was it when they were smelling it and it was bad? Or was it when it accidentally got in your mouth or something like that and you're just like, oh, what? It, it what got that out of my mouth? That's the Scottish Egyptian, in case you were wondering. Number four, waste removal. This one is kind of a broad stroke, but hear me out. There's no plumbing, no waste removal, and people kind of just go wherever they want. A lot of that unhygienic waste is kind of just laying about. However, the people of Egypt also had the advantage of the Nile River, which means they used that bad boy for everything. Transport, irrigation, a water source, and of course, a, a bathroom. Which in case you didn't know, your source of water and irrigation should be two separate, that, that shouldn't be, they shouldn't go together, that's not good. This is a good explanation for the plagues of Egypt, besides the sin, bad sinners, no sinning. As years of that kind of negligent waste management are liable to make any pharaoh sick. Don't mix your water with the poo, don't do that, that's bad, don't do that. Number three, sunscreen. This should come as no secret to anyone out there, but with my rosy cheeks and fair complexion, I would not do very well in the sons of ancient Egypt. Honestly, I don't know how Luke Skywalker lived on Tatooine with those twin sons. Without a little copper tone action, you know what I'm saying? The Egyptians had an answer to that problem, however. Not the whole living on Tatooine part, that, that just kind of sucks no matter what. Blue milk is weird. They had a makeshift sunscreen using rice bran extracts and a few other ingredients that were meant to help protect against the sun's rays. How effective was it really? Not sure, because the only stuff I'm willing to test out is the real stuff. And if I get burnt, then I start peeling. And then somebody has to rub aloe vera all over me. Be right back, I'm gonna get some sun. Number two, cursed craft dinner. You've got no plumbing in your palace, and it's time for dinner. So how does an Egyptian royal make his favorite pot of KD without water? I mean, if college kids can do it in their dorm room, surely they can master the art of post-secondary cuisine. 
Well, for some unlucky folks, it means taking a pot and walking down to that old Nile River, almost like people rely on water or something, and take a big scoop of water and bring it back. But while you begin to scoop some water, you may notice someone is picking up crocodile dung. And people are bathing in the water. And, and to your left, there's a maiden washing clothes. And to your right, there's a man doing something I can't repeat on YouTube. Oh well, time to scoop some more water up and consume this clean, nice water at home. Oh, this is the best. Tastes like the village. It's nice. Number one, pink milkshake. Does it still count as hygiene if you ain't breathing? I say yes. Besides the pyramids and maybe the Nile, mummies are the most famous things about Egypt. And in a weird way, it is hygiene. Hygiene for the afterlife. When someone super important passes on, it's time for a little game of operation. Stomach, liver, intestines are removed and put into jars. You never know when you might need that next. The heart is left because it's the heart and the Egyptians were diehard poets, so you got souls in there, you gotta keep that. The most grim process to me, however, is turning the human brain into a forbidden milkshake by mashing it with a small spike and then draining it out in what must have been the grossest waterfall ever. Oh God, that's, oh God, that's so gross. <laughs> anyway, then you take some linen and start wrapping the mummy up like a dad wrapping last minute gifts on Christmas Eve. Bada bing, bada boom, there you go. Buddy is prepped for the afterlife. Uh, don't mind me, I'm just gonna be sick from the brain milkshake, ooh. Kicking off the list at number 10, skincare routines. For a long time now, having pale skin in Europe meant that you were among the wealthy because in the 17th and 18th century, this suggested you could enjoy the indoors. You didn't get sunburns working outside all day, AKA wealth. Keep in mind, this was long before sunscreen was ever even a thing. So at the time, the best thing to wash your face with was something called chemical wash. That was a mighty wash. This thing packed a punch, that's for sure. This wash would ideally get rid of sunburns, pimples, ringworms, smallpox, scurf, or morphew. I don't even know what scurf is, but it sounds awful. I don't want it. And your skin afterwards would be pale and literally glowing. Thing is, all these foundations were made with old timey, horrible, poisonous recipes. One of these facial creams, I swear I'm not making it up, was literally this. Steep the lead in a pot of vinegar and rest it in a bed of horse manure for at least three weeks. What? I'm trying to get rid of bags under my eyes. How am I supposed to steep lead? What am I, Walter White? I don't know how to steep lead. I can barely steep tea, let alone lead. Moving on, I'm upset. Number nine, natural or painted. Today the internet is full of makeup tutorials in every corner. Doesn't matter what style you're looking for, help is now available. You can learn how to draw on eyebrows while listening to a true crime story. You know what I'm saying? It's perfect. The makeup game is crazy, but back in the 1800s, you only had two looks to choose from, really. You had the painted look or the natural look. Natural was light on the makeup, more of a paste look than anything, almost like you're a Victorian painting, you know? One of those? But to achieve the lighter look, Europeans would use actual paint, like paint paint just lead-based paint. And the most important part of applying this is that you can't smile. You can't even move at all. Any emotion will cause the paint to literally crack. Again, that's why all these paintings are so serious. Madame X, the portrait of Virginie Amélie Avegno Goutreau, originally painted back in 1884. At first, Sargent made the woman's strap slipping off her shoulder. That was a little, you know, scandalous, a little oopsies. That was deemed too scandalous for the upper class society around him back in the 1800s. So John had to literally repaint these straps back on. Yeah, backlash was so strong, John had to move after he sold the painting. The guy left Paris because of spaghetti straps. What a nightmare. But this is what I'm talking about. You start drawing veins on pale skin, people would lose their mind. Love that pale veininess. Number eight, beauty patches. 1800s beauty patches came in many different shapes and sizes. Take this portrait from 1755, for example. Joshua Reynolds painted Charles the Ninth, Lord Cathcart, rocking a pretty large beauty patch. The guy literally looks like the rapper Nelly. That's massive, it looks like a band-aid on his cheek. Whereas other fabrics used in the 18th century were much smaller. They were tiny circles, hearts, stars. If you found this, you'd think somebody was gearing up to go to an Arctic Monkeys concert. They were often used to cover up smallpox scars. They were made out of silk velvet and they were applied with glue. Now the patches were dark black to make the pale pop. But the location of where these went also had purpose. A beauty patch in the corner of your eye meant that you had a lot of passion. On the forehead, that was meant to be majestic. And a dimple patch, oh, 
Well, you're a cheeky one. That's uh, the scandalous one you are. The position of these patches could also determine your political allegiance. Historian Joseph Addison took notes on these positions when observing two parties from the 1800s. One party had patches on the right side of their face and the other had the opposite. That's like switching jerseys back in the 1800s. You're like, ah, this team sucks. Number seven, mouse skin eyebrows. Okay, Stuart Little, if you're watching this, skip to number six. You don't wanna see any of this, all right? Trust me, it's not good. Back in the 1800s, as I mentioned earlier, the cosmetic game was harsh, to say the least. The eyebrows too, they had a rough go. Eyebrows were completely plucked off back then in order to make the forehead bigger. Yeah, you need that 1800s five head. That's the trick, apparently. Imagine if I shaved my eyebrows off and then painted my face like pale white. Honestly, I'd do it for the clicks. I'd do it for you guys. This five head look didn't last forever, thankfully, but for a hot minute, it almost got worse. In the late 17th century and early 18th century, these leading ladies would shave off their eyebrows and then they would glue on mouse skin to replace them. Like a band-aid, only horrible and stinky. Since their face was freshly painted and the glue game was weak, they would have one shot only to stick these puppies on. You just gotta eyeball it and hope that it works and that it looks in the right spot. I don't know. You put them on too low, you're gonna look upset all day long. Eyebrows are angry sisters, not angry twins, okay? Remember that. Number six, lip paint. Red lips always lie, especially when you don't know that ammonia is mixed in with it. How jolly. Back in the Victorian era, the pale look, red lips, beauty marks, you were trying to look like a literal queen. That was the whole point. So women in the 1800s would either make their own compound themselves, which didn't work, obviously, or if they had some money, they would buy some. The main ingredient in these days were not ideal. Crushed up insects, which already could cause allergic reactions when applied to your lips, but the ammonia mixed in really put the nail in the coffin at that point. Ammonia and crushed bugs? What am I, oogie boogie? What am I making here? What am I applying? Number five, corsets. I can't even imagine how hard it was to wear one of these. Like, I have no chest. I'm just a diving board. And already, this is a nightmare. I can't even imagine. The Victorian corset, okay. <gasps> Tiny waist, curves, look, the whole thing. Obviously, this was horrible for your body. Just looking at this, you're like, ugh. Your ribs would literally slowly deform, as well as your spine misaligning. But instead of talking about how horrible this obvious one was, let's talk about that corset duel from 1836. Yeah, have you heard about this? That's a real thing. Hungarian princess Pauline von Maternick was married to Prince Clemens. She had to marry her uncle when she was 20 back in the 1850s, so surprise, surprise, she was a little unhappy. Weird, right? So since the marriage began, her husband, he was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, whatever. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun in life. Then he's like, ugh, what are you doing? Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she defied convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess, to a duel in nothing but a corset. How badass is that? To this day, it's not yet determined who won, per se, but a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks? Yeah, that should be a musical. Forget Frozen. I wanna watch this on DVD, let's go. Number four, Deadly Nightshade. Macbeth's soldiers used deadly nightshade to poison their enemies. And during the Victorian age, women would apply nightshade to their eyes, just so they look nice. Awesome, so this is horrible, let's talk about it. The pupils would become larger after this, okay? That was the whole point of putting poison in your eyeballs. The thing that makes deadly nightshade so commonly known is the sweetness of the berries. Have you ever been outside and you see a berry and like 30% of you really wants to eat that berry? Well, curiosity kills. Deadly nightshade can be found in Europe, Asia, and Africa. It grows purple flowers in groups of three, along with those inviting purple berries. Just two to four berries can kill a human being, so don't, when in doubt, just don't eat them. And the flower as well, don't ingest this, you'll get poisoned. And also, don't put any near your eyeballs, in this century or the next. Number three, bustles. So while corsets are one nightmare, bustles are just an entirely new thing. Tiny waist wasn't enough, eh? Had to get big old dump trucks as well. These Victorian folks went hard in the paint. Figuratively and literally, I guess. Bustles were also known as the Grecian bend. Big old booty bend, that's it. It came to town in the 1870s and it took the idea of wearing a cage as a skirt to just having the back part extend out. Ah yes, an update, an upgrade, I guess. Then the fabric was draped behind the butt. Hope you don't like sitting down ever, because that's obviously not an option. 
Corsets would move your organs around slowly, and bustles would slowly damage your back. So let's leave this one in the 1800s. I think that's probably for the best. Number two, red lead redemption. Look, I'm pretty new to skincare routines, but I'm trying, okay? I'm trying to get rid of these bags under my eyes. I'm trying to sleep and drink water, all that jazz. Back in the 18th century, those bags under your eyes were a lot harder to get rid of. Lead mixed with vinegar, this would make you look more pale. If I used this, I would literally be a ghost. I would just be invisible. I would, you would just hear a voice in a green screen right now. In the 18th century, that pale look was ideal, but this lead vinegar mix also smoothed out your face. So, what could go wrong, right? Queen Elizabeth I used cosmetics containing lead, mercury, and arsenic. Those powerful three things you don't want anywhere near your face. Yeah, arsenic too, the same deadly poison that took out George III and Napoleon Bonaparte. Just the worst ingredients in the 1800s cosmetics game, really. The Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry has arsenic on its priority list of hazardous substances. Toxic metal exposure is still an issue we're facing today in this century, so I hope this is eye-opening. Sans poison eye drops, I hope it's eye-opening. And finally, coming in at number one, deodorant. What did people even do before Old Spice? You know, before that guy was born, how did we know how to smell good? What did we know how to do? Deodorant was first introduced to the public back in the late 1800s, and it was called Mum. It was a cream that used zinc oxide, and it was stored in metal cold containers. That's just not, nothing like speed stick at all. It's not discreet in any way, shape, or form. It wasn't long until the first antiperspirant came along right after it. It was called Everdry, and it was always damp, ironically, and it would always burn your underarms. It literally would eat through your clothes. I think at that point, I'd rather smell bad. Like, let me have rashes, let my face look horrible, let the bags show. I don't, I'd rather do all that than any of this. This is horrible. Number 10, the switchblade comb. Hey, leather jackets, smacking jukeboxes, and a switchblade knife. Nobody was cooler than the Fonz on Happy Days. Well, maybe your uncle. Everybody has a cool uncle. But something I just think is silly, or something a lot of men probably use today, or at least the super cool guys who have no idea what or who the Fonz is, the switchblade comb. Basically, it's the same thing as a switchblade, but instead of a small blade, you got something to comb your hair with. Because when you're a man, you have to look fresh and tough at the same time. Trust me, ladies, it's, it's how we operate. Gotta look tough, gotta look mean. And kick the jukebox, Hey, Number nine, the ball jacuzzi. I don't know about you guys, but there is nothing better than a nice hot tub. I'd like to say I spent a lot of time in hot tubs with cute girls. However, due to my financial situation, however, most of the hot tubbing that I've done has been at public pools where I shared a hot tub with older Italian and Greek men who I swear were still wearing sweaters, but that was just their hair. Speaking of hair and saggy skin, meet the Tescuzzi, a tiny hot tub for the Pisha deal and two matzo balls. Hey, I understand, your undercarriage has to stay clean and honestly, I would love one. Chris and I were talking about we want one, we might even share one. Who knows? Number eight, the all-in-one. All right, man, this one goes out to us. The manly men, the dads, the sons, the brothers. The men who work all day and night and still have time for their family. I appreciate you and I see you, brother. Want to know why we have so much time, ladies? Well, that's because we've cut back on time in the shower with a very five-head invention. We call it body wash or face wash. Or shampoo, because we use it for everything. Three in one, yes, that's right. If we buy a body wash product, that means it will be used all over our bodies. No time for L'Oreal Pantene, or that purple shampoo with the kangaroo. We speed run shower so we can get back into doing the things that you ladies love. Like not putting the toilet seat down. Number seven, king of the porcelain throne. Kings, I hear you. Life can be busy, and the shower speed run is not the only product that we've invented. Here's another shout out to all my kings who take extra time while sitting upon the porcelain throne. I salute you. Yes, that's right. Besides doing the hygienic process of evacuating one's bowels, we take a mental health break in the bathroom. A time to check in, relax, take inventory, and take a breath of some not so fresh air. Especially if you ate Taco Bell the night before. Is it strange to sit there in that situation? Perhaps. But like any other guru, we need a space to feel our spirituality. Would Yoda be Yoda if he didn't meditate? Mmm, sit on the toilet, I will. Number six, the beard apron. This is just so smart, and I'm seriously considering buying one because this is the bane of my existence. Sometimes the lumberjack look is too much for me, and the closer I get to looking like Chris Farley, 
the better. I think I have a great motivational speaker impression. Maybe I'll show you guys one day. We'll see. I don't know. However, when shaving my beard, I have nowhere to go. And it's too cold in the winter to do it outside. So... That's why this is so smart. Basically, it's an apron that you post up like a hammock. So when you're shaving down those chiseled cheekbones of yours, all the little hairs fall into the apron. That way your GF can't yell at you because there's no mess to be made. Necessity truly is the mother of all invention. Number five, bacon products. Who doesn't love bacon, right? Bacon is delicious. Bacon is a delicious meat that can be enjoyed for breakfast, lunch, or dinner. Personally, there was nothing like waking up on a Saturday morning as a kid to play some GameCube and eat bacon and eggs, my favorite. I was a tubby kid and I was easy to impress. However, while bacon may not be the king of the breakfast table, it is the bootleg flavor of fragrance and the non-food market. It seems every time there's a store, gift shop, or novelties being sold, a bacon flavored, scented, or themed product is there for men. And it's not far behind. Because yes, we are tough and rugged. And we eat meat because we're cowboys. So that also means we want breath mints that are artificially bacon flavored, right? No, we don't. They taste horrible. It's awful. No one wants that. Nobody wants that. Number four, bath bomb. Call it genius marketing, crazy society, or people wasting money, but a lot of hygiene beauty products that women purchase, men do too. They just gotta repackage it and inject it with 300 cc's of testosterone because men. Take the hand grenade bath bomb for instance, taking bath bomb to a whole other level. Yes, the one I saw while researching was very colorful and it looked like it had a fruity scent, but it was shaped like a hand grenade from the second world war. No way an adult man would fall for that, right? Pfft, no! Chris, you see my rubber ducky? Number three, the man bun. Honestly, I don't mind this trend. I actually think it looks good. Certainly better than the mullets of the 90s. There's no way you can tell me mullets look better than man buns. You just can't. The man buns are actually somewhat organized. Especially if dudes grow them out and maintain them. However, what is strange to me is the man bun add-on. Yeah, it's like a man bun extension. You just it's like a, like a clip-on. Basically, look like the guy who plays Wonderwall at every party for the low, low price of $19.99. I can't be dissing too much, though, because I wore a clip-on tie to the ninth grade. But the girls thought I was cute? I think? I think so? Number two, gendered products. Another broad stroke here, but when things get placed in the categories, there's always two colors that get used. Pink for girls, blue for boys. While I'm not sure whether colors are actually masculine or feminine themselves, it has been hardwired into most of us, that's just how it goes. Anything plastered in blue or male-like imagery, it's what's meant for men. I, however, as a kid, had an absolute five-head play. To protect my valuables from thieves and villains in the night, I always chose something that was girl-themed, pink, or something a boy wouldn't pick, as I thought if presented with my stolen items, I could always identify them since only a boy would choose girly stuff. From my Nintendo DS to my notebooks and honestly everything in between. I, Hot Pink was in and Chetty made it work. I thought the plan was foolproof. I, I never really thought though what would happen if a girl took my stuff though. That, that, that didn't, I didn't really think that wouldn't work for that, would it? No, it wouldn't. Number one, wine in a can. This one is just so silly to me and for any wine connoisseurs out there, take this with a grain of salt. I'm no sommelier, but I enjoyed the odd glass of wine, even if it comes from a box. I always thought the wine glass was elegant, higher class, but that doesn't mean you have to be higher class to drink it, or be less masculine. Well, now there's wine in a can for men, because we can't have flimsy glasses, we'll break those glasses because we're so strong, oh yeah. I just can't imagine wine in a can tasting good, it has to be worse than wine in a box, right? Uh, let me know in the comments guys, I'm curious, what do you like to drink? Let Chetty know, I'm, I'm curious, I'd love to hear. And hey, coming in at number 10, baths. From bath bombs to jacuzzis, when did people exactly start warming up that cold river water to sit in for some R&R? &R? Well, apparently the Romans were the first to think about warming her up. I don't really know if they had it in mind that warm water works better and faster to clean and rid of microparticles and had more of a oh mentality, but one way or another they did it. Were they really ahead of their time though? The first bathhouses have been discovered in Rome approximately being built somewhere in the 2nd century BC. The first of its kind from a river of cold water to the abundance of over 500 steaming prominent bathhouses. You could pamper yourself head to toe for a small price, small enough so that even the poorest could bathe. That's a lot of small business owners. Hottest water in town, step right up, step right up. The Romans came up with an idea to build a spa house thing which could be flooded and heated by the floor beneath it. With a giant fireplace inside the spa, it was lit by hand and blown through the vents under the floor. Damn, they were smart, huh? Hot and steamy and good for the body. 
and clean. Well, cleaner. The bathhouse was a technology of its own and it seemed like humanity was headed in the right direction. No, no they were not. Number nine, wiping. Do as the Romans did. It's thought that these people thought of literally everything before us. Oh yeah? How about pogo sticks? Think of that? Huh? pogo -onitis? No. No you didn't. Look that up, did they? Over the years I've had some pretty shitty jobs, but nothing as shitty as this one. Literally. Uh, sire, would you like fronteth to backeth or backeth to fronteth today, sire? That's right, there was a job for that. People had to have had started wiping at some point, right? But who exactly and when? The groom of the stool, chief gentlewoman of the privy chamber. Call it whatever you like, we know what they did. So what exactly did they wipe with? Well, usually hay, sticks, fur, or even seashells. Every single one of those sounds itchy and terrible. I know what Charmin can do sometimes, and I can't imagine what a piece of oak could have done back then. Was there splinter taker routers as well? I can't help but feel although how painful and stinky it was, I'm sure there was at least one shared laugh, a little quality time spent with some royalty to say the least. Although this career is speculated, both King Charles I and King James I had them, so unless they decided they wanted to do that after them, someone must have continued doing it. I hope for a pretty penny at least. Those waste management dudes have pretty good benefits. Filing your taxes, looking for a job description. Uh, ah, yes, here it is, wiper. Number eight, urine. Okay, is this just gonna be disgusting the entire time? Well, the answer is yes. History's pretty disgusting. Okay, this one is weird because right when we think we figured it all out, something jarring happens, like a jar of piss and all the health benefits it had throughout history. Uh, I'm sorry, what? Well, at least they thought it did. In ancient Rome, not only was this liquid gold sold for, well, gold, it was often traded as a prominent good, sold for its multitude of healing purposes. You see, people have been using urine for thousands of years. That's right, this destructive, toxic bodily fluid could be repurposed, salvaged into many different topicals and treatments. From hair loss to your daily skincare routine, it was not only great for staining and softening leather made for shoes and clothes, it was a natural teeth whitener, an antiseptic. <laughs> That's right, from ancient Rome to as late as the 20th century, people have been tinkering and tailoring with their pee. Egyptians did it, Greeks did it. Urine is the body's natural antiseptic and was soon turning septic. Like the science behind this alone is what your buddy tells you, you know what I mean? Oh, rolled ankle? Yeah, yeah, just piss on it. Got ghosts? Ah, eh, just pee on it. The ailment for all your needs. Disgusting. Number seven, teeth. Invented in 1488 by Sir Robert Tooth. Okay, I'm joking, no. Teeth were never officially invented, but what we did for them and how we cared for them had people scratching their heads for the last millennia. We've all had a toothache at some point in our lives, so they must have had them back then. In fact, oral hygiene was utterly disgusting. I didn't brush my teeth after my coffee and I can already feel it. Ew. People's teeth were so bad throughout history that dentists were actually training and teaching each other what to do about the huge toothworm problem. That's right. Imagine worms growing inside your teeth. Well, due to the swelling and pressure, people thought there were actual bugs or evil spirits living within their sore tooth, serving them extreme pain. Nope, just an infection. You need a root canal. Oh, and actual worms and bugs living in the tooth. Uh, yeah, you see this gray area right here? Uh, that's a ladybug, right? It's medieval England and things were pretty medieval. Right down to the surgery and if you had an impacted wisdom tooth, well, that wasn't covered. England, 400 AD. People started this new trend of oral hygiene cleaning but it wasn't spin brushes and floss, no, more like mint and vinegar and prayer. Just kind of swoosh it all around in your mouth and wipe your teeth with your shirt and call it another year. If you were lucky enough to rinse your mouth out at the time, then you could have saved yourself a visit to the medieval dentist chair. Well, actually just a slab of rock you sit up against and have a friend who's good at ripping. And there you go, buddy. Hey, wake up. The infection alone from the dirty tools going into your mouth is making me itchy. I feel like my breath stinks more now after I've read this topic. Anybody have any gum? Number six, toilet paper. Finally, something we recognize. Invented originally in China in 851 from the Tang Dynasty, these soft fabric sheets were designed for, well, you know what it was designed for, but yes, mostly the emperor's bathroom breaks and soon caught on for the commonwealth as well. The higher the class, the softer and more luxurious the material. From leather to silk, butts were seeing a kinder, gentler side of hygiene. Two ply bark versus four ply silk. The use of toilet paper throughout Europe is a messy one. Again, wipers and hay and stuff like that. It wasn't until the toilet paper rule created by Joseph Gaiety in 1857 
that this hygiene method would solidify and stay for keeps. The classic under versus over is the tale as old as time. You ever want to get into a quick argument at someone's house? Just peek in the loo, see if they're rocking beard or mullet. It's the simplest way to have a know-it-all show you the patent and tell you how to wipe your own ass. Charmin. Number five, the great stink. Um, the what, what? Oh, no, 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 yeah, I read that right. The Great Stink of 1858 was an event in central London in the summer, during which the hot weather exaggerated and amplified the smell of untreated human waste and gunk that had washed up on both in and on the banks of the River Thames. The problem had been growing for years with an out-of-date technology and overflowing sewage system that emptied directly into the river. The stank was thought to have been the root cause of a number of contagious diseases and three outbreaks of cholera before it was agreed upon that a small problem was emerging. You think? Long story short, all the garbage, human waste, bloated bodies were all just washing up around the same time. Hey, I caught one! No, oh, that's an arm. Okay. And just cooking in all that sun all day? I know what August feels like and I've smelt my garage and garbage day and I can't imagine the smell already in central London at that time. And for people to have complained so much that it was even stinkier, that's absolutely rotten. Number four, nose gaze. I was just thinking, where are all these inventions and blueprints on how to stop the smell? If you can knit metal into a crop top, you can cover your mouth and nose, can't you? Well, close enough. Nose gaze were invented. Basically just big nose plugs one would wear day to day to drown out the smell of absolute filth. Just plug it up and ignore it was their mentality. A makeshift wad of bunched up herbs and flowers shoved up your nose, blocking the nasal cavity from the stank that followed. Just see number five. A poo-pourri for each nostril. Would this make things worse, ignoring the smell? Wouldn't that make it even harder to find out where it's coming from? Nope, just band-aid it. It's gonna disappear on its own. We're humans, we're designed to smell stuff for our own survival. The smell is like what lets us know not to go down there. Oh, no, no. Like, wouldn't everything just smell like roses at that point? These people were trying to avoid the stinky streets because that actually meant that's where the infection and disease was actually hanging out. The blind leading the blind. Number three, flushing. Okay, we're making some ground here. We got toilet paper, we got something for the smell. So now where do we put it? Well, plumbing and flushing wasn't connected to each house like it is today. See, the Greeks and Romans had it down to a science. They built drainage systems and learned from the ancient Mesopotamian people how to exactly deal with the problem of waste. A system of pipes, tubes, and drains. The bathroom problem seemed like an easy solution. Use gravity downhill to dispose of the waste outside the city. And here's the kicker. It can even be reused and repurposed at the end as an irrigation system, further nurturing the farming of crops. No, that's good. No, he's right. And then it disappears and literally goes downhill again. After the Roman Empire had fallen, this European dark sanitation era had begun and hygiene sort of just slipped away. People weren't really concerned with things like disease and plague and instead leaned into real science like witchcraft or burning cats for fun. You know, important stuff. It wasn't until about the mid 1850s where people revisited this age old problem and recreated and did exactly the same thing science we already knew. Things were unnecessarily stinky for way too long. It wasn't until the British colonies started tinkering in Boston around the 1700s that proper piping and toiletry transport was eventually built and catalogued. Thus was born the first sanitation system again. And we still see it today, thank God. Number two, disinfectants. How did people exactly know if something was clean or not? They couldn't have just seen the particles back then. Let's see your chamber pot. Smells clean. People were plugging their noses so they couldn't even smell anything. They couldn't smell if it was clean or not. There certainly wasn't a demand for a fresh lemon scent that we're all used to. This was the birth of some basic antiseptic. Chemists were mixing and matching chemicals and a new form of cleaning agent was introduced in the 1890s by German chemist science Gustav Rappenstrauch in hopes to rid the country of the overflowing cholera epidemic and seize the spread of germs and the disease. By mixing benzalkonium and hydrogen peroxide, you were left with a chemical compound that would destroy and clean infections on medical patients. Light bulb. Thus leaning towards the direction of an all-purpose surface cleaner, killing bacteria and ridding the area of harmful toxins. And drum roll please, Lysol was created. That's right, the same Lysol we use today. This was a push in the right way for humanity. An easy to use liquid cleaner that would aid disinfecting everything in its way. I've seen the bottle and the Wemyss labels. Must have been even stronger back then too. Hope no one spilled it on themselves in testing. 
Ooh, ouch, that is a class one chemical burn. <laughs> You're just gonna wanna pee on that for 12 to 13 days. And number one, soap. Finally, the end of all our ailments. Soap, the answer. Well, not really. See, it's been around since the Romans because they literally did everything before us and stop bragging, we get it. Made out of animal fats, ash, and mostly lye, these makeshift balls of soap were invented years ago. And then forgotten, and then invented again, and then forgotten again. Cleanliness was loose, remember, and it was almost uncool to believe in science, and it wasn't really until the mass production of this chemical detergent that it really stuck. Soap was predominantly sold produced and commercialized in the late 1800s. By this time, scientists were fiddling around with things like Lysol and more chemical compounds, sparking its way to the study of germs, a vital step towards large-scale soap production. And it actually started in 1791, when a French chemist, Nicolas Leblanc, patented a system for making soda ash from salt, at which point added with animal fat, and there you have it. The slippery bar we're all used to today. The discovery made soap making one of America's fastest growing industries in 1850. And it seemed from then on in it was only up. It's crazy to think that someone at this time, even after soap was invented, were still spit shining surgical instruments to be clean. That's good. Kicking off our list at number 10, seam squirrels. I love squirrels. Being Canadian, we see quite a bit of them. They're a little too friendly for me at times, but they're great. During the Old West era, seam squirrels were, well, not what you think. Personal hygiene was not a priority for many people back then, obviously, and lice infestations were unfortunately quite common. Now, the type of lice that affected people during this time was commonly known as body lice, which is pretty horrible. That could be found in the seams of clothing, hence the term seam squirrels. Yeah, not actually a squirrel at all. It's just body lice. Gotcha. Body lice, of course, was a major problem during the Old West era, and they were responsible for the spread of diseases like typhus, trench fever, and relapsing fever. Relapsing fever? I haven't even heard of that one. That's terrible. These diseases were often fatal because, you know, ye Old West, and many people in the Old West succumbed to them. To combat the spread of lice and the, you know, one of many diseases that they carried, people in the Old West often resorted to extreme measures, such as burning their clothing or even shaving their heads completely. That's why you see old cowboys and they look like they're stressed, they have no hair, their clothes are just gone. You're like, what happened? Lice, lice happened. Some people also used remedies like vinegar and kerosene to try and kill the lice, so yeah, it was a rough time, either way. Overall, lice infestations were a significant health concern during the Old West era, and they played a significant role in the spread of disease. Yeah, it wasn't just rats in the medieval era, it was also lice which is even grosser, in my opinion. Number nine, Old West Dental. I could use some Old West Dental recently. I gotta, I'm chewing on one side right now, you know what I mean? In the Old West, dental hygiene was not a priority for everyone, they couldn't afford it. And also, dental care was often very sparse. You couldn't really find it anywhere, for that matter. People generally didn't have access to modern dental tools or products, and many did not have regular access to any dentists at any point in their life, which is a sad but real fact. That would suck, I'm terrified. However, there were some basic dental hygiene practices that people in the Old West may have followed to keep their teeth, you know, somewhat in their heads, you know, keep their gums not rotten. Didn't do much, but did something. There were toothbrushes. Not many, but you know, wasn't as good as Oral B. There's some stuff. More often than not, you'd have to use twigs or chew on mint, that kind of natural survivor stuff. Some people may have also used a cloth or a rag to rub their teeth clean. Yeah, don't forget your tooth cloth before you go on vacation, I guess. You gotta and put it back in your pocket. Your old woody teeth, gotta rub those. Access to professional dental care was limited in the Old West. Some towns, some, had dentists, but all they did back then was just pull out the problem. They didn't give you a crown. They're like, which one hurts? All right, get out of here. All without anesthesia. So that's a great time. You're gonna remember all of it. Other options included a community toothbrush, which is hilarious to think about and also so sad. Yeah, some public establishments had a public toothbrush. Can you imagine? Go out, have a little brush, check your teeth. All right, cool. I'm gonna go back to the bar. I'm gonna be sick. I'm gonna actually throw up right now. Number eight, no spitting. Spitting was a common habit back in the Old West. You see it in movies and parodies. They're always spitting on the ground and stuff. Well, it's because it's real. It's a real fact right there. It wasn't officially outlawed. However, many towns and cities did prohibit spitting on sidewalks and inside of public buildings because 
Yeah, please don't do that. Thank you so much, sir. This was largely due to concerns about hygiene and of course, like I said earlier, the spread of disease. In addition, spitting was considered rude and uncivilized behavior. Yeah, of course, and many people were offended by it. Middle of conversation, guy just spits in between your feet. I'm like, wait, don't do that. Please don't do that ever again. Some businesses even had signs asking customers to not spit on the floor. Can you imagine what kind of hole you're in? You have to ask people not to do that. There was also social norms in place that discouraged spitting in certain situations. For example, it was considered impolite to spit in the presence of a woman or in formal settings, which, yeah, I agree, still do that today. That's great. Despite these efforts to discourage spitting, it remained a common practice among cowboys, miners, and other workers in ye old west. They're like, yeah, I have shit in my mouth. I don't know, we don't have water. I'm gonna spit, sorry. Number seven, communal towels. Ugh, this one's so rough. It's exactly what you think it is. It was a ride. Today, we have paper towels that you pump like 13 times just to get a little sheet, or sometimes, if you're lucky, that Dyson air drying thing where you just dip your hands in for like 13 seconds and then it's done. You're like, oh, the future is here. That's always fun, that one. Back in the old west, communal towels were often used in public restrooms and other shared spaces. Yeah, just one towel for all, just a dap off everything that's wet or damp back then, ew. These towels were usually made of cloth and hung on a rack for multiple people to use just in public, like it's your bathroom. While this may seem unhygienic by our modern standards now, it was a common practice at the time. So yeah, I don't know, we can laugh a bit, I guess. People were generally less concerned about the spread of germs and diseases back then, and communal towels were convenient, and they were a cost-effective option for public spaces. However, with the rise of awarenesses about hygiene and germs and all that nasty stuff, the use of these towels Towels eventually fell out of favor in the earliest 20th century. Thank God. Imagine dapping off your lips after eating some wings with a communal towel. Some cowboy just, you know, huh, and then he, huh, and then, huh, 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 and then you come in and wipe your, that's so gross. Number six, hair care? Yeah, I added a question mark there because, I don't know, not much TLC going on on top back then. Throughout history, people have used a variety of natural ingredients for hair care. Nowadays, guys have it too easy. It's like Axe five in one. It's like hair, armpits, legs, feet, all in, like, no way you can do all of that. Popular methods in the Old West were whiskey and castor oil. Yep, all on your big exposed head, right in the sun, there you go. Pantene Pro-V wasn't a thing then, so folks were rubbing their heads clean with castor oil. That's a nightmare. Whiskey was believed to help cleanse the scalp and often promote hair growth, while the castor oil, that option, that was thought to moisturize and condition the hair. So that'd be a fun two-in-one back then. That's great, put that in the stocking. These ingredients were readily available and most importantly, they were affordable, making them popular, but also, realistically, it was their only option. The guys doing whiskey, he's like, yeah, let's clean it up. Clean up top, it's so hot. It's like, ugh, really burns. Number five, medical shows. Today, medical shows, they're fascinating. Dr. Pipple Popper, I'll watch that all day while I eat. I don't even care, I'm disgusting like that. Dude's getting mashed potatoes squeezed out of their backs. So I'm like, ah, let's go, I love it. I'm slapping that thumbs up, it's my shit. Back in the Wild West, the 1860s, the 1890s, you know, they had what's called medicinal showmen. These are, what an absolute joke, what a con. These guys would go town to town selling elixirs and tonics, everything one needs to live a happy and comfortable Western life, but they were full of lies. None of this shit is true. These professional medicinal showmen would have pawns run ahead and plant themselves in the audience before these random demonstrations of amazing medical elixirs, right? These shows, a bunch of bullshit. They would call up random audience members, that guy that ran ahead, and then use one of these elixirs and magically treat their ailment on the spot in front of the public, right? Almost as if it was a magic show. One of the most successful of these elixirs was the elixir made from John Healy and Charles Bigelow. It was a mixture of herbs, roots, and animal fat, said to treat any and all illness. But in reality, it was just an extremely strong laxative. So yeah, if you're gonna take it, make sure you're close to home. Yeah. Number four, bad bartenders. When we think of old saloons, old West saloons with the swinging doors and stuff, a few catchphrases and a cowboy with some whiskey, all that good stuff. The bartender back then would pour a drink. The cowboy would take the bottle instead. So illegal, sir, that's that. Please put that back. Back in the wild, wild Western days, grabbing a drink at the bar wasn't like that at all. It wasn't like anything you see in the movies. It sucked. Bartenders, they had no regulations to follow behind that dirty bar. But not only was it very high proof, but some bevy like tarantula juice was just, it would just poison you. It was literal poison. If its name didn't tip you off, it was literally made with poisonous ingredients. Cause that was, that's how cowboys did it back then. But they're hairs. I don't know. Tarantula juice was made from strychnine. If you drink it, you're gonna feel like there's tarantulas crawling all over your skin. 
That was their pitch back then. They're like, eh, happy hour, come get tarantula juice. I'm like, awesome, thank you so much. How do I not tip? Which button do I press to not give you money, you freak? Number three, grow it out. In the old west era of the United States, men often grew their hair long as a practical choice rather than a cool fashion statement. You know what I mean? All those bandits with their long hair, they had to. Living in the rugged and often isolated terrain of the west, men had to perform many physically demanding tasks like hunting, ranching, mining, pouring whiskey drinks and tarantula juice. Long hair would help protect their scalp and neck from the sun and wind and all that good stuff. But it's important to note that haircuts were not always easily accessible back then. And many men back then could not afford them or did not have access to a barber. It's like, I can't cut it. He's like, where? We don't have anything. We don't have dental. What do we do? As a result, growing their hair long became a practical and functional choice for many men back in the old west rather than, you know, style. And they weren't going for looks back then. They weren't doing man buns, doing the cowboy thing. They're like, no, I have bugs. I don't want you to see my bugs. I'm gonna grow it, thanks. Number two, outhouses. This one here stinks. In the wild west, outhouses were sadly common as indoor plumbing was not yet available. Didn't think of that yet. So these structures were often simple and consisted of a small building, if you wanna call it that, with a hole in the ground for your Huh, your waste disposal, if you wanna call it that. Now, due to the unsanitary conditions and lack of proper waste management and knowledge and you know knowledge about germs and stuff, outhouses could attract a variety of insects and other pests, and it was just bad to go in there. Flies, mosquitoes, other bugs, they were commonly found in and around these structures, and they could potentially transmit diseases to humans. So, if you're in there, you really get your business done and then get out. You don't want to waste time. You're not checking any tweets while you're in there, that's for sure. Despite the unsanitary conditions of an outhouse, they were a necessary part of daily life in the Wild West. And people learned to tolerate the bugs and just deal with it. Because they're like, you know what? This is better than going on outside. Whatever's going on out there, we're good. Close that up. One time I went to a cottage when I was younger and my mom didn't tell me that they had only an outhouse. No running water the entire week. And I was like, awesome, let's turn around, I guess. I'm not doing that. I held it for like seven days straight. It was a nightmare. And finally, number one, broken bones. I'm lucky enough to have never broken a bone. I mean, knock on all the woods. But what if you did back in the old Western days, right? Then what would happen? But is a cowboy gonna heal you up? No. What if you were trying to learn a kickflip and you broke your leg? Then what? What are you gonna do? If the dental plan was any indication, it's... It's not pretty, not a lot of options. In the Old West, broken bones were a common occurrence, particularly among those who worked in physically demanding jobs, like ranchers, miners, cowboys, around livestock. Those things kicking you randomly, something's gonna break. Treatment options were limited and often relied on first aid techniques, you know, splinting the affected area with whatever materials were available, such as wood, cloth, or even animal hides. It sounds crazy, but back then, that was really the only method for immobilizing broken bones. Pain relief, that was only provided with natural remedies, such as oak or willow bark tea, so. You're gonna feel that entire healing process. It's gonna suck. More serious fractures, like ones that, you know, go through the skin, those require the attention of a doctor or a surgeon. However, you know, those medical professionals back then were not always available in the remote areas of the Wild West. No helicopter's gonna come in and grab you and then take you out. No, it's, you're basically fucked more often than not. About all things hairy and how the French royalty all aspired to cosplay Rapunzel. A tale originating from 6th century Paris, France is about two princes who were going to ascend to the throne. They were kidnapped and the queen consort was given the choice, allow her grandson's hair to be cut or let them die with their luscious locks intact. She chose the sword over the scissors. One of the princes does manage to escape and he cuts his own hair and becomes a monk. In modern times, saying all right, kill him instead of a haircut does sound crazy, but back then men who had long hair showed their power and wealth. According to the Byzantine poet historian Agathias, it is the rule for Frankish kings to never be shorn. Indeed, their hair is never cut from childhood on and hangs in abundance on their shoulders. Their subjects have their hair cut round and are not permitted to grow it further. In Germany, men also typically wore their hair long, but they would tie it up in a bun or on the top of their head and sometimes hide it under a fancy hat. In general, dark ages were a time where women did rarely cut their hair, and there wasn't really any time period where short hair for women was trendy then. Lower class women typically wore their hair up in braids and buns because it was easier for them to work with, while upper class women got to style their hair with more intricate processes, using ribbons and metallic wires to help keep their braids and buns in place, like a Leia. On the other end of the spectrum, however, bold is punishment. To address why the grandmother would allow her grandson's death before a haircut, in today's world, men shave their heads 
heads for all sorts of reasons. They could be naturally losing their hairline, have alopecia, or they're just prone to hair loss. However, in medieval times, hair was considered a symbol of power for royal men, as explained. Royal men never cut their hair, so the longer the locks, the more powerful you're supposed to be. So as a man, if you let go of your hair, this was a huge sign of humility. If the grandsons from the first story had returned with shorn hair but are meant to be the throne's heirs, they would make the throne look weak and susceptible. Only monks would shave their heads, leaving a narrow strip of hair horizontally around. Other times, only in the middle of a man's head was shaved and the rest was left alone. And of course, as you may know well from our other Dark Age videos, head shaving for women during this time was a degrading punishment, as a woman's long hair was meant to be her most seductive feature. We talked about one type of head hair, let's travel down to the other, bearded baddies. Recently, beards have made a huge comeback, especially now among the young generations thanks to throwback fashion. And studies have shown that people also associate a man with a beard as being more intelligent, and many people find them to be incredibly attractive. Also, nothing is cooler than the giant dude with the bald head and like the big ass beard, you know, let's be real. Respect for beards though is nothing new. During medieval times, knights were known to grow their beards as a sign of honor, and if one man touched another man's sign of honor, well, it was enough of an insult to challenge them to a duel to the death. Now, shaving was common during the Middle Ages. Commoners would be clean shaven for the most part. Royalty was also usually shaven or had a very trim beard that was kept neat and tidy. Hilariously, however, this is kind of how barbers get started. Back in medieval times, mirrors were very small and cloudy, so they're not reliable. They were also only available to the upper class. On top of that, razors as we know them today didn't exist, so if you want to shave, you need to use one of those dangerously long razor blades. So most folks would visit the local barber surgeon for a Sweeney Todd style lineup. As we mentioned earlier, monks had shaved heads and no beards, so they took turns shaving one another as a community. And speaking of faces, the Dark Ages were surprisingly skincare obsessed. Vikings are remembered as some of the most hygienic of historical people, and they were reported to have the best practices of personal hygiene in the early Middle Ages especially. Most notable was the near daily bathing they did in the cold waters of fjords and rivers. They used combs made out of ivory or innate wood carvings, and they practiced braiding their hair for prestige and ranking. The daily practice of bathing and personal hygiene actually was what spared the king of Poland from an outbreak of plagues that had been seen in Europe. Meanwhile, in England, bathing was not as common as it is today and it was often reserved for special occasions. People would usually wash their hands and faces regularly, however. The ideal woman in the Middle Ages had that pale, smooth skin without any pockmarks or blemishes. Nearly everyone washed their face with cold water at the end of the day, even if they wouldn't wash the rest of themselves for inexplicable amounts of time. Some women used ointments made of animal fat in order to keep skin soft and smooth. And crystal girlies, even back then, people believed in the power of gemstones to heal. Women would lick amethyst and rub it over their pimples to make it go away. But rest assured, when it's bath time, you were naked in a crowd. In many Middle Age cultures, public bathing was commonplace. The Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, they were especially known for their bathhouses. And in the spring and summer, commoners could be spotted using streams and rivers to take a bath on a nice warm day. Back then, this wasn't seen as being indecent or strange. Water was scarce, and the process of heating a bath was time consuming and expensive. So, it was also common to share bath water among a lot of people and be less wasteful. However, people are still humans after all, so, like teens at a pool party, public bathing became associated with a certain level of sensuality. Seeing as this was a time period where intercourse was usually in hearing or seeing range of your imminent direct family, it's not a surprise this happened, let alone the fact nobody actually cared if it was. Well, except the church. They threw a bunch of laws around to try and limit that crap, but that's always what they've done. Anywho, in Japan, they still continue the tradition of public bathing in hot springs to this day. However, they have the option to segregate when men from women, so it's not as often that people leave the public bathhouse to hook up nowadays. Not to get you guys too excited either, but face washing brought in controversial hand washing. Contrary to popular belief, some groups of the medieval people actually wash their hands multiple times a day. Jewish people in particular made sure to wash their hands before eating, and Christians adopted the same practice. But even unreligious peoples would sometimes wash their hands after eating, since a lot of people didn't own utensils, and wiping your hands on fabric ain't always gonna do it. Case in point, honey garlic wings. In upper class families, guests specifically were always requested to wash their hands by pouring water out of a pitcher called an aquamanil, which was poured over a basin. These aquamanils were often in the shape of lime, 
giants or people or mythical creatures. However, no one was washing to the extent of using soap for 20 seconds. The water in these small pitchers needed to be shared among a large group of people. So people in the Middle Ages simply splashed water on their hands before drying and poured the dirty water right back in to wash someone else's fingers later. But you'd think that soap would be involved, especially because endless people essentially had a dark age Etsy store. Today, soap is made out of essentially the same products every time. Back in the Middle Ages though, people used a lot of different substances in a cauldron like witches making a potion just trying to produce some semblance of soapy stuff that don't smell bad. Most successful was a combination of lime, wood ash, lard and oil. Black soap, aka soft soap, gets its name from the dark color of the wood ash lye used to make it, and the cast iron it was often boiled in. Hard soap was made with high quality barilla ashes, which creates a light colored lye. Therefore, white soap quickly became equated with high quality hard soap. The stiff soap was then molded into cakes and bars, added dried flowers to the outer side, and the quality and scent of the soap changes depending on how wealthy someone is. Unfortunately, Casey didn't catch the keyword in there a few times, folks made soap with lye, which is so harsh it can remove skin if you scrub a little too hard. Next is how the world could have had toilet paper faster if they weren't judgy wipers. China had toilet paper figured out as early as the 6th century, making small squares of rice paper that would decompose into the ground and take the feces with it. Pretty eco-friendly stuff. However, the Europeans found this to be horrifying because they thought it was disgusting that the Chinese only wiped without actually washing their backside with water. Meanwhile in Europe, they're using a communal sponge on a stick that sat in a bucket of water that wouldn't be changed all day, so please tell me which is more unsanitary and horrifying. In medieval Europe, people sometimes used devices called gonfus, or a gonf stick, as well as a torchicule, or a torch cut. The gonf sticks were sponges on a stick as described, where the torchicule was anything to wipe the bottom. Like straw, or moss, or leaves, or wood. You know, the basics. Who has time to care about eye bags, though, when you're walking around wearing a gag preventer nose bag? Even though medieval people clean their bodies a, a little bit more than you'd imagine, that doesn't mean the towns were sparkling clean. When you stepped outside, you came face to face with human waste, rotting food, and trash riddled streets. Horses regularly relieved themselves on the street, as did the live animals in the markets, and so did the people. Also, animals just kind of died in places, and people would leave them there. Add in the smell of mold from straw houses, and the smell of diseased human or animal skin, and sometimes even corpses, these bad smells were at their worst in cities and large towns. Things were so incredibly smelly, people nearly gagged, especially when it all began to bake under the hot summer sun and heat. So in order to combat the smell, some people wore nose bags, which were fabric-like masks that were filled with flowers and other fragrances that would be able to help the stomach smell the streets filled with waste. Men and women whipped their put noses in the nose bag, give them a huff, and life is good again. The lesson here, be thankful for Breeze and use it. And of course, the weirdest for last, the ear spoon. Sounds promising, doesn't it? While nowadays, people use Q-tips to clean your ears, which apparently we aren't even supposed to be doing, as cringeworthy as it sounds, people use long wooden or metal spoons called ear spoons or ear picks to remove the wax. Ear picks were also frequently made of bone, ivory, and brass as purely utilitarian items. Archaeologists have found them amongst the Vikings primarily, where it was common for them to carry an ear spoon on a chain around their neck so that they never have to be without their little tools should they ever have to degunk themselves. Ear spoons were used by all levels of society in medieval and post-medieval England following the Tudors. The 17th century English knew about plaque, which they called scale, and they were encouraged by their doctors to scrape their teeth frequently. So these little Little doodads expanded to include that purpose. And how could I not mention that while a tailor normally would use beeswax to coat thread and make it stronger and easier to use, with no bees available, earwax would do. As gross as it may seem to us today, earwax was worth saving and selling. Number 10 is a rocky time, because toilet paper didn't migrate its way over to Europe until the 16th century. Before, it was all sponge sticks and rocks, baby, and stones were actually a pretty common bathroom solution for the average Greek, who used rounded pieces alongside ceramics known as pisoi, which translated to pebbles. They kept a pile of these pebbles in their lavatories in some cute little Bed Bath & Beyond brand wicker baskets for whenever it was time to freshen up. And similar to how we have the phrase, toilet paper doesn't grow on trees, they also had the 
saying to encourage a little frugality in the bathroom. Three stones are enough to wipe. But my favorite fun fact is some of these pisoi sometimes originated as ostraka, the pieces of broken ceramic on which the Greeks of old inscribed the names of enemies. The ostraka were used to vote Big Brother style for some pain in the well, you know what, to be thrown out of town, hence ostracized. Check out the Bumblebee video Top 10 Historical Laws That Defy Logic to learn all about this strange law and phenomena, and maybe subscribe to our Hive while you're at it to stay up to date on all our video releases. This creative recycling of ostraka as Pesoy allowed you to quite literally wipe your on the name and representation of someone you hate. However, the downside is that ancient Greek society had immensely high case of hemorrhoids, so you win and you lose. Number nine is red lip, pale face, and I'd say she was breathing in snowflakes too, but there wasn't any of that in ancient Greece. At least I don't think so. While nowadays there's a massive culture of skin tanning and darkening, but in olden times, it was the opposite. It was pale, pale, pale. People wanted to look like chalk, loaves of wonder bread. The closer your complexion was to that of HP printer paper, the better. Even if it meant the Greeks would powder their entire bodies with lead to achieve it. Now that was around 200 BC, but thankfully by 1000 BC, they'd wisened up and realized rubbing poison over their entire body maybe wasn't the vibe. So instead, they mixed it with chalk. Cause you know, diluted poison isn't as bad as the full thing, and then they smeared that everywhere. At least it was less deadly. After achieving the visage of freshly prepared mayonnaise, Grecian gals would then mix up some red iron deposit powder with fat or wax and rub that on her lips. And now, ice that cake with mascara. Don't worry, it's only a mixture of egg whites, resin, and ammonia, you've now achieved the supernatural glam that doesn't make you look like the puppet from Saw at all. Number eight is scrape it off. The ancient Greeks looked at bathing as aesthetic purposes first, actual hygiene second. Bathing wasn't to clean away dirt per se, rather to beautify the body. The Greeks did invent soap down the line, but prior to the advent of public baths in 600 BC, they started off using box of clay, sand, pumice, and ash that they'd rub away with olive oil after applying. The same oil that they'd then scrape off. This was done with a strigil. But that's okay. After 600 BC, you can always have a nice refreshing bath, right? Think again. Contrary to popular perception, not every city or village in ancient world had a public bath, or even if it did, they weren't always open to everyone. Even when they were in fashion, if you were from a lower class, the best you could expect would be scrubbing yourself with old and pure olive oil that multiple people have already applied, scraped off, and returned to the same barrel for all poor people public use jug. If you were extra lucky, there would be a wash bowl, but then you'd be expected to share it, or even the water with someone else. Speaking of, number seven is sweat sales. So unlike the poor who scraped oil off into a container and reused it over and over until it eventually became sludge, or the rich who could use oil once and then just toss it out, athletes of Greece would scrape their oils off into special little containers. It's the same with their actual sweat to be sold. Sweat could easily be collected with a strigil the same as oils, and it would carry the dead skin cells and grime with it. This was called goilos and the servants or athletes themselves would be expected to harvest it for people of Greece to do all sorts of weird things with it. These scrapings would then be sold as medicine, beauty products, perfume, you name it. People would rub the sweat of athletes on their skin, believing it to calm aches and pains, which it probably didn't do particularly well. If nothing else though, the Greek people, after rubbing some sweat and dirt on their skin, got to smell like an Olympian and enjoy some of the youthful vigor of the young men it came off of. At the same time, the gyms themselves would cash in on their youth users bodily fluids and would often scrape their walls and floors for extra good. Then invite companies to bid on the bottles of sweat. So the next time you're at the gym and you get off that machine and you leave that fresh layer of you do where your back used to be, wipe that crap off before someone harvests it and sells it like a freak. Number six is mystery creams. I only call them that because it's a mystery why they'd ever want to use these products as creams. I want to know who woke up one day and slapped some crocodile crap on their face. How did they figure out that this was a skincare thing. Someone had to be the first. I like to think that person fell in it, woke up the next day looking radiant, but whatever. Yeah, so crocodile dung was a big, big part of Grecian life because so were the animals, but it was far from being a nuisance. Vain folks saw this as an opportunity and the croc dung became part of many recipes for effective skincare treatment. This is face masks, contraceptive, hair masks, feet soap, 
folks. Hell, one recommendation for treating scars or crow's eyes around the eyes was by applying a little crocodile dung as eyeshadow. To quote a Greek medical document, levigate the dung of the land crocodile with water and anoint. If they have the means and the monies, people might even also have a whole dung bath in order to feel rejuvenated. I feel like that last one might have been a bit much, and considering the story of the ancient Greek philosopher Hercolytus, I am not far off in that opinion. Afflicted by swollen skin, he decided the best course of action would be some dung therapy. He buried himself in warm dug and mud in order to treat his condition, however, he stayed in the pile too long and ended up overheating and dying. Number 5 is some hair raising standards. As you can probably guess from looking at the statues and other works of art they left behind, the ancient Greeks weren't a big fan of bodily hair. For them, the ideal body, especially for women, was smooth like a dolphin all over. Naturally, in a time before Gillette razors and Shea Butter Shave Cream, twas not that simple. Since they didn't have modern waxing solutions or even razors, despite making the strigil, which if they had sharpened even a little, could have been made for the perfect razor slash hedge trimmer. So the simplest way of achieving the beauty ideal was to simply pluck out individual hairs one by one. A painful, not to mention time consuming process for your legs alone. Imagine trying to do that around back when mirrors haven't been invented yet. Fancy a swifter solution? Well, how about burning all your body hair off, also the custom in ancient Greece. Best part of that, a lot like today, is if you don't keep up with the societal expectation of shaving, you'd receive a lot of disapproval and discomfort from others. But unlike today as stated, it was a lot harder for them to shave, so the fact that expectation was there is insane. This is all about the power balance of the sexes, however, as respectable women's ritualistic deletion of her natural state attests to the male supremacy over his objectified wife. While he has his manhood intact, she must deplete her womanhood and thus alter her innate form so as to uphold the classical ideal. Somehow that didn't apply to eyebrows though. No, no, no. Those had to be like full Frida Kalho experience. The Greeks wanted their ladies' eyebrows to look like a push broom on their damn forehead. In case you ain't picking up what I'm putting down, unibrows were all the rage. Even if you couldn't get to grow one, you could always draw some in. Number four is the bush, the favorite of the 70s and of ancient times. Historically, ancient Greek men have had an absolutely fascinating relationship with their down their hair and how they cultivate it, the styles of trimming and manscaping changing per centuries in the overtures of cultural change. In the classic period, the trimming and even shaping, yes, shapes like a heart or a sparkle or a loaf of bread, I don't know, I'm just spitballing, were done on a men's down there. Naturally, this was easiest and most elaborately done by aristocrats, while the poor and common men did more basic triangles or squares or whatever you can do, I don't know. Anyways, by modifying his natural state down there, a man can remove himself from the realm of ordinary man. I mean, think about it. Natural down there growth equalizes every man post P, but the aristocrat elevates himself with this shaven distinction, idealizing its subject as a man more sophisticated than one who possesses unruly and uncontrollable tough. However, during the Tyrannicides revolt, Greek artisans started repping the au natural in challenge to this. In general, the artistic representation of pubic hair became more naturalistic, abandoning the archaic array of wildly shaven flourishes for simpler and subtler trim jobs. The Greek state began to show that it valued the average citizen with both its institution of democracy and by extension its more naturalized rendering of down their hair. The increasingly liberated down their hair on the mid 5th century masculine sculptures exemplifies this development. The ancient Greeks continued to fluctuate through down their hairstyles afterwards and their paper trail or perhaps hair trail isn't subtle either. Sculptors throughout centuries mark these changes as does scholarly works such as Asterophon's Listatria. Number 3 is teeth cleaners. Gotta get your chomper squeaky clean somehow. And back in ancient Greece, you had a few options. First off, powders would be made as toothpaste, and these would be substances like lum, ashes, clay, peppermint, propolis, fennel seeds, cardamom seeds, and a magic substance called mastic. Mastic is also a resin that's a strong antiseptic. They also added abrasives like sand and crushed bones. These powders would be applied to a thin, dampened cloth, string, or twigs, all of which would be then used to rub, buff, and shine in between and on the teeth. By the time of the Roman Empire, the elites had actual servants whose job it was to clean others' teeth and you could visit them and pay for a wash job. Now to address the whole year and mouthwash thing we've all heard about at some point. It's true, but it's not. It's not like the Greeks were gargling the early morning dark yellow. They were adding derived properties from urine to their toothpaste. So that brings us to number two, which is the uses of urine. Similar to how you can harvest salt from water, you can collect important acidic properties from processing urine. This is still awful and gross, but only because in modern times we're a lot more squeamish to concepts like that. In fact, people back then weren't even unaware that it was kind of crazy. The poet Catalyst once mocked his 
clean tooth enemy, Agnetius, who, to quote him, has shiny white teeth and grins forever everywhere. If he is in court when the council excites tears, he grins. If he be at a funeral pyre where one mourns a son devoted, where bereft mother's tears stream for her only son, he grins, whatever it may be, wherever he is, whatever may happen, he grins. And he curses him out by saying to him that the higher the polish on your teeth, the more it proclaims that you have drank your piss. The Roman Emperor Vaspian famously instated a urine tax by taxing the public bins where people dumped urine collected from toilets. The tax was so lucrative that it was continued by his successor Titus. The collected pee was then sold as an ingredient to businesses, workshops, and tanneries, which subsequently were taxed for it. These businesses used it for tanning leather, producing soaps, refining tooth products, making medicine, making elixirs, and more. Ammonia, urine's key ingredients, was used by launderers to get stains out of clothes, and even farmers used it as fertilizer to grow the perfectly acidic fruits. Number one is Aunt Flo. It's being determined that there's a good possibility that women back then had fewer periods and lighter bleeding in ancient Greece than we do now in modern times, just because of diet, climate, and biological changes over history. But weirdly, the expectation was that they would actually bleed very heavily and regularly, and if they didn't, then remedies needed to be used to bring out the blood. Aristotle mentions menstruation being like the flow of blood from a sacrificial animal that must be maintained. As for stopping the flow once it started, the ancient Greeks took after the Egyptians, using a small wooden splint as the tampon base, then wrapping wools and linens around it before cramming it on in. Reusable pads were also made of layering cottons and wools that can be easily separated and washed later. Just remember not to wear any white in the hot Mediterranean sun while you're quite literally on the rag.